Okay. Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Tonight is Comprehensivist Wednesdays. This is done in conjunction with the Greater Philadelphia Thinking Society. Uh, tonight we'll be covering how is knowledge kept in our brains. It's part of an ongoing series on neuroscience uh, with our guest speaker, Sanjay. Sanjay. Uh, yeah, so um, hi everyone. Um, we are uh, going to go into a topic we started last, uh, last month, although this is a, an extension of it, but it, it stands on its own. We're really looking at uh, how information, so we started last, last month looking at how information uh, flows within our brain, um, animal brains in general, how information um, uh, exists, uh, the way that uh, neurons uh, are involved and uh, groups of neurons and in very complex situations, very complex ideas and thoughts, how the uh, large parts of the brain um, work together, uh, you know, millions and, and billions of neurons work together to uh, cause this flow of information um, that makes us behave and, and do the things that we do um, and makes our body function, etc. So one of the things we um, didn't go into last month that I want, would like to go into this week, uh, today um, is how the information is actually uh, maintained, how it's stored within our brain, how it's maintained, um, the, the characteristics of the information that uh, is there, um, and uh, you know, basically aspects around uh, what is, um, uh, you know, what, what happens uh, when uh, we have thoughts and we have emotions in our brain and how these are, uh, uh, how our brain represents uh, very simple to very complex. Although we won't go into the complex, that's, that's I mean, we don't really understand it right now. Um, we understand, we're starting to understand the beginning aspects of this. So we'll go into these things. Let me start um, my slideshow. Um, that's, I find it an easy way. So hopefully everyone can see this. Um, last week we had a problem with the, um, um, there's a host tab. So I don't know, Joe, if, if that's still visible or if that kind of goes away. Anyway, I don't, me, uh, uh, it is actually, uh, no, it's not, I don't see, it's hard to see, um, with the background that you have on top. I don't know if it's cutting it off or not. Okay. All right. So I will, um, go into, uh, so we'll start with the, no, it's the same fine. question. It's fine. Okay. It's fine. Right. Thanks. So we'll start with, with the question that I asked last time, and this is very fundamental to uh, information in the brain and, and in general what we're talking about. So how can information be stored in cellular tissue? And this is a question that I asked all participants last time. And if you were here last time, that's fine. That's good. Um, you were um, involved with it. But if you weren't, um, I want to just have a quick uh, Q&A type session. Basically, if, if anybody has an answer, that's fine. If you don't have an answer and you're curious about it, um, that is really why I'm asking this question, because this is something very important to, uh, to neuroscience in general. Um, and specifically why it's important is because information is something intangible. You can't hold on to it. It's not uh, physical, right? It's invisible in a sense. Um, and cellular tissue is the opposite. It is tangible, it is physical, you can hold on to it. Um, so how can something invisible and non-physical be stored in physical tissue? Um, so anybody have any ideas, any, any uh, clues? Uh, unfortunately, I didn't let anybody unmute themselves. So any, if anybody wishes to share or answer Sanjay's question, go ahead, type exclamation point in the chat. Go ahead, DLJ. Oh, good, I can unmute it. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll have a crack at it. Um, actually, I, I've not read about this, so this is just a guess. Is it the configuration? So it's the patterns, like uh, think of a switch, right? You can have ons and offs, right? So it's the combination of patterns that, that creates, uh, well, uh, a pattern, right? So, and then the pattern must be readable by something else in order to pick it up as information. Okay. So, uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll ask everyone to to ask or you know give the response, and at the end I'll, I'll summarize and go into how how it happens and, and who's. It, it, to me, it's not as important who is correct or not. This is a learning opportunity. So, 
Um, but but you're on the right track. Yeah, it's not completely correct, but you're on the right track. Yes, there's a nuance that I think is very important um, to clarifying what you said. But but in general, yeah. So Mike. Uh, so Mike snacks. Yeah. Thank you. Probably know what I would say uh, that uh, the start in the synapse <laughs> has a pattern, like uh, DLJ said, but um, it's uh, the way the synapse operates. Uh, uh, it starts uh, in quantum states, and uh, the, so a whole image can be stored in one synapse. Penrose, Ella. Thank you, Mike. Uh, so next up, we have Vanessa. OK, I'm thinking perhaps maybe you kind of uh, get stored like either in the same area, like the exciting to it gets excited to the, maybe the same intensities. Like so a pattern kind of would be created. So whether it's the temperature or the. I guess the speed at this, uh, which they're firing, it probably would be consistent to some extent within the same individual. Uh, thank you, Vanessa. Judy. Uh, I have no idea, but <clears throat> I think it, it's a process improvement. It's slowly but surely uh, has gotten better throughout evolution. And um, it has to do with energy that is transmitted or encoded. So there is some sort of involvement there of problem solving and, and, and coding and process improvement. And I don't know, there's a combination there, magical combination that exists. Thank you, Judy. Uh, so next up, we have Madeline. Well, uh, let's see, since each neuron can have multiple connections and those multiple connections can all have multiple connections. <coughs> and then a network of those multiple connections can all uh, join together in different ways. There is, a virtually infinite, a virtually infinite amount of information storage available, but um, it looks like an odd question to me. Um, it, since it's being posited as information is intangible, invisible, and non-physical, um, clearly here the information is is physical. I mean, it's sort of a Sort of a metaphysical question, which is, you know, is does such, do things like this exist outside of their physical medium, whether it's the brain or a book or, um, I mean, it's sort of like saying, how what is a journey when you're in the car? So just because we perceive it as being intangible, invisible, and non-physical doesn't mean that it is. Okay. Um, um, yeah, we sorry. have we have one more uh, one more uh, person, I believe, Kevin. Yes, thank you. I would use a partly tangible in physical area. Some areas store such data, and uh, also it's uh, you can kind of readable, but you you, you may be not in, in tangible, but you can kind of read readable. Thank you. Okay. Okay, well, so thank you, everyone, good. for your answers. Uh, go ahead, Sanjay. Yeah, um, great answers. Um, some answers were going into um, areas of, uh, um, uh, you know, speculation, and, and there are a lot of controversy around. You know, for example, what Mike said about quantum states and, and uh, storage of quantum information within synapses. But in general, um, everybody touched on aspects of it. Um, from what I heard, Marilyn um, was, uh, at least in my view. Um, uh, she was portraying it the way that I think of it, that most neuroscientists think of it. So um, in general, what, what happens with, with uh, brain tissue in general, uh, neuronal tissue, is that um, they are interconnected in a, a network. And the information is actually in between the neurons. So they're not specifically in the neurons. That's something that's very important to, to mention. That information is not stored within any single neuron. Um, and they're not stored in technically the synapses either. The synapses are junction points that connect the neurons, um, but there are actually uh, usually thousands of synapses from uh, any single neuron. 
So there are you know, thousands of junction points that that one, that that one neuron has. But that's the simple answer. There's actually a lot more layers to this, which I won't go into. But in general, the, the simple way of looking at this is that the network itself and the structure and topology of the network stores the information. And that kind of elucidates the, the, um, the perplexing aspect that uh, Madeline uh, you know, talked about, that um, you know, how could you have uh, information stored in, in a physical structure because the information is the physical structure. Well, what I'll, what I'll add to is that information is, is actually more than just the physical structure. The physical structure is what we can see, but, um, and, and this is a part that I didn't go into last time because it is much more complicated. And even this time, I don't think I'll be able to go into it. Although one of the, um, the uh, um, advanced videos that I've linked to, um, the fifth video, goes a little bit into that topic. And I don't want to go too much into it because it's, it's much more advanced. It, it goes into dynamical systems. It goes into... Um, uh, time-related uh, behavior. So basically, a neuron over time behaves. And that's the aspect that I'm talking about, is that out of those thousands of connections that it has, it's not that all of those connections or, or a subset of those connections are active and the other ones are not. It's that every second or every millisecond, basically, which neurons are, which uh, neighboring neurons are active or activating or activated by this, this uh, neuron we're looking at, and vice versa. It's a very dynamic process um, for many seconds for a single neuron. And then so this cascading of signal, this, this movement of signal back and forth oftentimes is really where the information is stored. So it's, it's dynamic in nature. It's not just static. So time is an aspect of the storage of the information. That's something we're not going to go into because it is much more complicated. But in general, the, the structure of the matrix of the neurons in, in the brain um, is highly important. That's the main thing that's necessary to store um, anything that we have, any, any memory that we have, um, anything that we've learned, or even innate um, behaviors that we have. You know, for example, our, our uh, basal brain, our, our core brain, regulates our heart rhythm, um, regulates our breathing, metabolism, you know, temperature, etc. So those things are hardwired into our brain through evolution genetically, but those also are stored in the form of memory, and, and even those um, come into play. So what I'd like to do is, is go into specific um, processes that um, require information. And um, so sensation, perception, experience, these are things that we, um, uh, through the physical world, we bring into our brain. Memory, memory is something that we, once we've, we've experienced something in the external world, um, or if we had a memory from our past, that memory can activate and, and create new memories. And it can combine with what we're experiencing right now. So, so storage recall is actually an aspect of uh, called you know, confusion delirium, which also affects memory. We're not going to go into that, but memory is, is pretty complicated. Um, cognitive activities, we, we've talked you know, numerous times about this. Um, when we understand something, when we're reacting to an event, when we're making a decision, um, when, when we're trying to solve a problem, these are all aspects of cognitive uh, activities that we humans um, uh, perform. And these all are major processes that our brain has to do. Uh, muscular activation, believe it or not, when we're moving, um, our brain, um, many parts of our brain get involved. It's not as simple as, as it may seem. Um, the information, the signals that flow from the single act of, of, let's say, our eye blinking or a single finger moving, you know, just, you know, s simply, um, it actually involves back and forth uh, multiple times through many layers of the brain. Uh, primarily driven by the cerebellum, but but it, it you know a large part of our brain is activated um, through in in, in uh, musculature, so that's and all of those signals are information. They're simpler than thoughts, but they are information. And then our core brain, I talked about respiration, you know, cardiovascular aspects, these aspects that which keep us alive, keep keeps our body alive. These are all um, also dealing with information within our brain. So these are all things that are are um, examples of information. Um, that our brain needs to process. Uh, but the main ones that we deal with, uh, or that we'll do, deal with in the talk tonight, um, and in general, the ones we're concerned about are cognitive aspects, uh, aspects of memory, and then uh, perception, experience, these, these things. The first three are, are the important ones that we generally talk about, although the other ones are just as important for, for functioning, to, for us to do anything um, in the world. So types of information. Let's um, look at, so information exists within the brain. 
um, there is this concept of awareness. Now, awareness, and again, this this gets into the into the the core brain, uh, part of the brain that it, there are set points um, for respiration. So every person, um, their body, their respiratory system um, breathes at a certain rate. Not only breathes at a certain rate, but the amount of inhaled volume, the duration of the inhalation, um, how rapidly we exhale, um, the pressures involved. All of these things are set points. Um, that are in our brain and our brain and, and some of it uh, starts from in utero when we're in the womb and we possibly absorb it from our mother we may absorb it from other ways and part of it may be genetic um, and then after we're alive and after we start growing some of it may also be epigenetic but nonetheless these aspects of our body are controlled by our brain and there's information that's kept in our brain so that our brain can control all these things and What's important is that these are set points and they're aspect of memory. So they're stored in our brain somewhere, um, but they are set points that can change. And that's one of the reasons why, for example, when you have people who, um, you know, do, uh, let's say um, they, they can train their mind um, through biofeedback or through, for example, yogis and, and meditators who spend years doing it, they're able to, to control very, very um, innate aspects of their physiology, which is almost impossible for the average person to control. But because these there are set points that they have access to, they learn to access those, you know, over years, um, you know, these are controlled by information that's variable in our brain. Um, and these are all kept in the brainstem. Another aspect of information, another type of information are what we call emotions. And I've often said that emotions and thoughts are really indistinguished in the brain, at least from, from looking outside, you know, looking at the brain from the outside. Um, it's almost impossible to tell the signals that are present, whether they're, they're involved in emotion or, or cognition. Although sometimes or oftentimes emotion exists in specific areas of the brain. So that sometimes gives us a hint. But other than that, it's very difficult to tell. And again, emotions also have set points. And that comes into um, our childhood. You know, during our childhood, we learn certain ways of behavior. We, we see the, na the, the adults around us, our parents often. Um, and from them, we um, develop these set points um, in a mood, temperament, um, rate of speech. You know, people who live in, in very urban areas or very, uh, quote unquote, fast moving areas tend to, you know, we, we have this concept of a fast life, um, speaking quickly, um, reacting quickly, not pausing. Um, these are also parts of the set points in our emotional being. Um, so there are many, many types of set points in our emotions that, that are also there. Um, and these are kept subcortically and also cortically in the cortex. Um, thoughts, that's another type. Um, these are very important. And uh, thoughts basically involve things that we learn. Um, they are, um, uh, uh, you know, th there are many, many types of things that we learn. Th there are things that we learn um, in school. Um, we, we learn things experientially as we go through life. Um, you know, we, we realize that there's this, this thing called gravity and everything th tends to fall toward the earth. Uh, most of us are not taught that early on, you know, as, as a child, we kind of observe that and, and realize that, but that's a type of learning. Um, then we have conscious uh, activities, or conscious problem solving, for example. These involve thoughts. If you're doing, for example, a number problem or if you're, if you're asked a question by somebody else and you want to answer the question, um, that question excuse me, um, will reside within your mind um, in terms of thoughts. And you'll process those thoughts in specific ways to try to figure out what the question means, what the answer might be. Is it appropriate to give the answer, you know, honestly, or do you want to give an answer, you know, if, if it's a controversial topic, do you want to give an answer that's more um, diplomatic, etc. So the, the, these are aspects of, of um, conscious thought. Um, episodic events, you know, we experience things we, um, where we've been in, in the world, who we've met. These are all aspects of episodes in our lives that, that form memories and, and they um, uh, embed within our mind. Um, and, and these can be accessed by us uh, as thoughts. Um, and then um, these also uh, uh, exist in the cortex, uh, mostly. And then we have memories and memories are a combination of all of these, um, all of these things. Restored in the cortex, hippocampus is a, is a major part that, that uh, um, uh, accentuates a lot of that uh, activity. So university, universality of information. This is something. Th there are several questions that I asked in the, in the description of the meetup. So I'm going to go into some of those and just give ideas around uh, 
you know, what types of information uh, we have, um, whether information is the same across people, whether it's cultural or universal across all human beings or even all animals. Um, the, um, the nature of how specific types of information are stored in our brain, the categories of information that we might have. So some of these things that we'll go into a little bit right now. So the first question is really, do thoughts occur in everyone in the same way? And by thoughts, again, the, the last slide, any and every, anything and everything that, that pops into our head, uh, I'm characterizing it as a thought here, not simply um, cognitive you know, thoughts, high level thoughts, they're even low level thoughts. Um, so do thoughts occur in everybody in, in the same way? And the quick answer is mostly yes, um, for, for the most common things. And the reason why is because most of us live in the same physical world and we grow up in very similar cultures. So as I described gravity, pretty much anywhere on the planet that you live, and as far as I know, humans only live on Earth, on the surface of Earth. And so we experience, we all experience gravity in the same way, we learn about gravity in the same way. We experience the environment in the similar ways, you know, sunshine, nighttime, uh, day and night cycles, and wind, you know, sometimes earthquakes and, and lightning, so um, these are all aspects that we all experience, you know, different places. Some of us experience more of one and less of the other, but we all experience these things. We all live in social groups and social circles. Um, and so those are things that we all experience also. We all have bodies or most of us have bodies, you know, unless we, we're, we have some handicap, but we have bodies with, which allow us to grasp things and grab things and move and, and, and look and observe and smell and taste and uh, interact with the physical world. And so all of these aspects that we share with most other people, um, they actually cause the way that information gets uh, managed and stored in our brain to be very similar. Now, th this is not proven, but this is suspected that that's the reason why. What, what we've found in a lot of the experiments that have been done, most experiments have been, that have been done, have seen that the information that's stored in, in very different people's minds um, are stored in very sim similar ways in similar places and they're accessed in similar ways, although it's not identical. There are differences, but at a gross high level, um, they are very similar. And, and, and the suspected reason is because we have experiences that give us uh, the same types of, um, we live in the same similar, very, very similar world, um, you know, most of us. So that's the, um, the, the reason we believe that, that this, uh, this happens, that why most of us have uh, you know, thoughts in, in, uh, in the same way. Um, another question is, do specific types of thoughts occur in specific places in the brain? And for example, um, thoughts about, um, uh, let's say, I'm hungry, okay? Would they occur in a similar place in most people? Or a thought about the future, would that occur in a similar place? Um, thoughts about, um, you know, uh, what do I have to do? Um, you know, let, let's say you're given a, 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 a mathematics problem to solve. Um, would similar parts of the brain be used by most people to solve that mathematical problem? So these, these are the examples um, of what this question means. And again, in general, um, they are um, the types of thoughts that occur um, do occur in, in basically the same types of places in most people. So for example, when you're listening to music, um, the act of music is actually perception. It's not thought. Um, there's a distinction, but the music might evoke memories. Right, because songs have a lot of emotions in them, and they have words and lyrics. Um, there, there are specific authors and you know, singers and groups that are involved, so you may remember something about the, the singer or the group or the band. You might remember uh, a concert that you went to in the past. Um, so, when you were listening to music, we have different experiences from the different music that we that we hear. We have different tastes in music, so that's one of the reasons why there may be differences between some types, although. The processing of music is very similar in all people. The fact that it evokes memories, that aspect is very similar in all people, but the specific memories it evokes will be different for each person because we all have different experiences. Um, and similarly, so if, if you're given a math problem to solve, um, it will be, it, the attempts to solve it will in general be very similar. Your, your um, executive, you know, the frontal lobe will get involved. That's one of the primary areas that gets involved in tasks like problem solving, um, our memories will be accessed because the experience we have with that type of math problem, if it's a simple math problem, you know, four plus nine, pretty much everyone can solve it and we don't really have to go much into memory. 
Although the answer 4 plus 9 equals 13 is in our memory. It comes from our memory. So everybody will access their memory. But the specific locale of where 4 plus 9 equals 13 is stored in a person's brain probably will vary, but it will be in a rough region. Um, but it will be connected via the, the hippocampus, and that aspect will be identical in most people. So again, this, the answer to this question is that many aspects of, of um, the storage of these types of information are similar in, in people, but there are variability based on the specifics of what we're talking about, the type of information and the history that we personally have compared to other people. Um, is there a place to keep information that lets us recognize a specific person or a place? Um, and the answer is yes, they're actually very specific. So there's an area called the FFA, the uh, uh, facial fusiform area. And it actually, there's two of them. You know, our, our brain is uh, bihemispheric, it has two hemispheres. So, you know, almost everything there's two of. So the, right um, behind our ears, um, it's, it's kind of in the middle between the occipital lobe and the parietal lobe. There's a, a, a button, a small button sized area, two of them you know, on both sides. And that area is specific to recognizing in general faces, not specific faces. But near that area, there is a cluster, a larger cluster, which is which has been found to be where we remember the main people in our lives and people that we, we recognize. You know, it may, it may be celebrities or sports people or singers or, and performers, um, politicians, etc. People that we recognize, those memories tend to be in that area around the FFA. Um, as far as places that we've been to, there seem to be cells um, which uh, are known as place cells, though I'm going to give a caveat here. It's, it's not necessarily that there might be place cells. It might be actually a little more, little more complicated. It might be that there are specific cells that are part of a small cluster, a small network. So it might be, let's say, within a thousand or within a million cells. There might be a few hundred cells that are specific cells that encode the spatial information. And today we call them space, or some researchers call them place cells. But it might not be that those cells specifically encode spatial information. It might be that those cells require that small network that they operate with, and a set network that actually gives this characteristic of remembering the places. It might not be that these cells themselves are that important. It might be, again, that the network is much more important than these individual cells. But right now, we're not sure if there are specific cells that are important, or if that sub-network, that, that small network, I described if that's what actually causes us to remember specific places that we've been to in the past. Um, another example, another question is how does our brain encode, let's say, the taste of a crunchy apple uh, versus apple juice versus a radish? Um, so in this example, apples and apple juice have very similar tastes and very similar uh, uh, odors, although their textures are very different. Um, apple juice is, is fluid and and an apple is crunchy, it's tactile, um, we have to chew it, um, and radish is different in all senses. And, and so what, what this does is that we actually have, we, we um, and this, I'm, I'm, I pose this question specifically to kind of transition into the next area because the way that we encode information about the brain is very specific to the world that we live in and the types of things that we do in the world. And one of the things that the, one of the reasons why this this question is very important is because this question highlights a key aspect of our brain is that we we're animals, even though we consider ourselves fairly advanced animals, we are animals um, at, at every level, and all animals operate at a very basic, very primitive level when it comes to the types of things we're talking about about information, how information is stored. And this aspect um, shows it because almost everything, well, not almost everything that we know of so far, everything that we store in our brain is stored from the perspective of us as a, as a selfish animal. Okay, so think of it this way, that if you, if you ask a question, um, where is that apple? Okay, the answer inside our brain will be relative to me. Where is that apple relative to me? Okay. Um, so the answer to how does the brain encode the taste of a crunchy apple, it will encode that crunchy apple in the context of me, meaning I am eating the crunchy apple, therefore my mouth, my mouth, is a very important part of the encoding of that crunchy apple. 
and when I'm drinking apple juice, my mouth and my throat and my stomach, all of those are aspects of drinking. And so those will also be encoded with apple juice. So the difference between the encoding of apple and apple juice will be the physical parts of our body that are tied to those elements. This is very important to understand that our body and how our body fits in and works with the world is a part of the encoding of, of things that we know about. Um, so for example, if, um, if we have a, um, a car, right? Well, we sit in a car and a car represents a form of shelter to us because it prevents, it protects us from rain, for example, right? When we're in a car, you know, the rain won't hit us if, as long as it's not a, a you know, a, a, a convertible or the windows aren't open. You know, most cars will protect you from rain. Um, and so at the primitive level, our mind thinks of a car as an enclosure. At the simplest, simplest level, it thinks of it as an enclosure. So the car will also be kept in our memory, memory as an enclosure and other things also. So getting back to this question, a crunchy apple, there will be an area of our brain which encodes, which encodes the concept of an apple. And it will be a very generic concept of an apple, not a specific apple. And then just the way that, that in our English language and many languages, we have things like nouns and we have uh, adjectives and we have adverbs, etc. Our brain also has associated clusters around the main. So the main idea of the apple is this object, this thing, this physical object in the world called an apple. So when we, the encoding of an apple in our brain will involve that cluster which encodes apple. It might encode other things, other types of apples that we're familiar with, the Macintosh apple, Granny Smith, um, you know, many, many other, the colors of apples, right? Apples tend to be green and bright and, and yellow. I'm sorry, not white, green and red and, and, and yellow. So those colors will also be encoded with the concept of an apple. When we think of an apple, we might actually have a, an image that comes to our mind of an apple. And the image usually will be one color. It might be a red apple or a green apple. Some people can have more than one image. Um, but these images also are not the main um, encoder of apple, but they're associated information that also activates. So when we hear the word apple, what will happen is that the sound of the apple, or, or in this example, when we taste the crunchy taste of an apple, let's say our eyes are blindfolded and somebody gives us, you know, puts, puts a crunchy apple in our mouth and we chew on it and we start to taste it. And we start to realize it tastes like an apple. We don't know before that because we're blindfolded and we, you know, we, we've been given a spoon of an apple and we start chewing on it. The first thing that will form in our mind is that the flavors will go into our uh, um, uh, gustatory uh, sen sensors and our, um, uh, uh, sorry, um, the, um, uh, I'm having a blank right now, sorry, but, but the, um, uh, the area of our brain which uh, 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 perceives um, um, odors, um, that, that, that the, we will smell and we will taste the apple both together. And um, that will be the first thing that happens. And when those two things happen, they, that information will transmit into various parts of our brain. And then our memory will get activated. And that memory will immediately fire off that cluster, that main cluster, which encodes apple. Okay. And then we'll realize, then we'll have a realization. We'll, we'll have a conscious realization that we have an apple in our mouth. Okay. And when we're drinking apple juice, something similar will happen that it won't be crunchy. It'll be fluidic, but we'll have an immediate realization that it's apple flavored. Now, because our eyes are blindfolded, we might also have another, uh, another, um, you know, question pop up that is it an apple or is it the flavor of an apple? It might be, let's say candy that's flavored like an apple. It might not be physically an apple. So, you know, we might have a question mark tied to it because our eyes are blindfolded. Um, and, and if it's a radish, then it won't, it won't uh, activate the area of our brain, which encodes uh, apple. It'll activate a different area, which encodes a rat, radish, you know, assuming that we're very familiar with the taste of a radish. Um, and so as soon as we have this flavor of an apple and the, the activation of an apple, then that main activation may, usually in most people, it starts to activate other associated regions. For example, we might it, it, it might activate a memory of an apple. You know, maybe apples is, is one of the favorite fruits. 
to evoke a positive feeling. So our emotions will come into play. Or if, uh, if you really don't like the flavor of apples, then negative emotions might come into play. So that main feeling of that main um, activation of an apple will cause other areas of our brain to activate. And those other areas of our brain, if they're activated highly, they may cause other areas and there's a cascading effect. And then more areas of our brain activate. And then we have the full experience of chewing and eating an apple. But, but also one of the things that happens is that at that time, another area of our brain will be activated, which is our mouth and our tongue. The, our, our brain actually has uh, somatosensory uh, area and also a, um, uh, 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 area which uh, controls our musculature. So the area for controlling our muscles for chewing and eating and swallowing, those areas also will get activated because in that in instant we're actually chewing a physical apple. And, because, and, and we also have sensation coming from our tongue and from our nose. So this, those areas will also be activated. So the concept of an apple also encodes our mouth and our nose and, and our tongue for chewing. That's the reason why those concepts, those areas of our brain also are encoded as part of the concept of an apple because to us, an apple has to be eaten or an apple is eaten. That's the way to think of it. And, and the apple juice is drunk, is, is drunk, which means that we don't chew apple juice, we swallow apple juice. So, so similar concept, but slightly different muscles and slightly different areas of somatosensory area that I described will be associated with the juice versus a, versus a solid fruit and radish likewise. So this, this question really starts to get us into the areas of how information is encoded within our brain. Um, and the fact that information is very personal to us that we, we, at our core, at our simplest level, are very selfish beings. You know, Freud talked about having an id, right? And id is the simplest level in his theory. In his theory, the id was the simplest, almost like a spoiled rat, right? And in a sense, this aspect of our brain actually follows that same pattern in that we think of everything in the world from the perspective of me, my apple, goes into my mouth. That's the way our brain thinks of it, right? Um, and and uh, apple is actually... Um, encoded in uh, the olfactory bulb um, and, and uh, the gustatory uh, complexes, which are tied to that. They they're, they're work in similar fashion. The hippocampus, which brings in the memories of, of eating the apple or the radish, and the cortex, which goes into the processing and, and more uh, complicated memories that, that come into play. So um, these. Uh, so here's one more question, which I asked in the, the meetup, but this had, was a multi-part question, and, and we'll go into uh, just some of this. So. The concept of, of does everybody have a dog region of the brain? So we talked about apple region. And similarly, does everybody have a dog region of the brain, which encodes the notion of a canine or a dog? And the simple answer is yes, um, as long as you've experienced a dog in your life, you know, usually multiple times. Um, mostly, um, if, if you have experienced a dog, um, for example, you might live on a, on a very small rural island, which doesn't have any canines on there, and doesn't have any wolves, or doesn't have any related. Uh, species. And if you have not experienced them, then the first time you see a dog, you would not have a brain region that encodes for dog. Um, but you might, but you have other regions for other animals. So what might happen is that because you don't know, recognize this funny looking creature, you might think it's part, um, part jackal, and it's part cat, or part, uh, part uh, uh, um, cheetah, and a, and a part horse, because it, it's kind of a miniature horse in one sense. Um, it might look like a jackal to you, and it might even look like a like a, a, a leopard or something. You know? So the the region for a leopard and the region for a horse might be dimly um, activated in a person who's never seen a dog before, but they see a dog for the first time. And if they keep seeing the dog over and over and over, a new region in their mind would get created, um, and that new region would um, encode uh, for the concept of a dog. Now, the key part here, let me, let me extrapolate here a little bit. And th this part is a little speculation based on what we understand, based on what's understood. I'm going to, I, I think this is more or less correct, is that in this hypothetical example where a person has never experienced a dog before, okay, and that's, as we know, that's not the normal situation because most people on the planet, dogs are very common or almost everywhere in the world. Um, there, there are some areas where dogs are, are rare, although they are known. And so most children, when we, they grow up, they are taught the concept of a dog. So dog, dogs are one of the first animals that we learn about. And that's one of the reasons why, for most of us, dogs are encoded primitively because it's one of the earlier animals that we learned about. 
Um, and many people have pets as dogs, uh, dogs as pets. So, so that's another reason why dogs are very, um, they're encoded very er at an early point in our brain. Um, and because of that, because it's encoded in a very early way, um, the other animals that we learn about later, you know, second year, third year of, of let's say, kindergarten or, or, you know, at home, our parents teach us, right? A few months down the road, we might be taught of a different animal that, we've met, that we didn't know about. Well, what happens is that the encoding of the dog helps, or the region of the brain where that, the concept of dog is encoded, that helps us learn the concept of a new animal. And what happens is that new animal gets encoded somewhere nearby the concept of dog. And where nearby depends on which animal it is. So for example, if it's, let's say, a bunny rabbit. Bunny rabbits have long ears, right? And bunny rabbits tend to hop. And bunny rabbits are much more furry. And bunny rabbits are much more smaller. So if you think about the region for where dog is encoded, and in the three-dimensional space of the brain, if you find a spot where, you know, long ears and tiny and furry and hopping, the intersection of those four, you know, just for example, those four ideas, the intersection of that near the area where a dog is encoded, that is probably the area where the area where you'll have a new region for where you encode when you're as a child when you're learning about a bunny rabbit for the first time. That's probably the area where the cluster of cells that start to encode for a bunniness, that's where it would probably start to form. And this seems to be the, the pattern around how specific areas in our brain start to form. Because as a children, we all learn very similar concepts about big and small, right? And day and night, and mommy and daddy, and friend and, and et cetera. The, some of the basic concepts that we learn, we learn very universally. And those basic concepts help us to learn about more advanced concepts. So by the time we learn about a dog, we might learn that it's a living thing because we've learned about what's living by that time. And so the concept of dog will be encoded near the concept of living, not, not adjacent to, but somewhere near because it'll be near other things. It might be near um, four legs because you know we might, uh, or we, we might be familiar with plants. So it might be near a plant. So, you know, this is, this is um, the aspect of, of how, you know, earlier in, in uh, you know, I said that many, many of the common things that we all encode in our brain are encoded very similarly. Now, a caveat here, or elaboration, is that that cluster for a dog consists of, of, of um, you know, millions of, of neurons. And the truth is that it's not, that cluster is not in one specific location necessarily. That cluster might be diffuse. And it, there, it actually may actually be more than one. And the, the truth, the fact is that it seems to be more than one because dog, the concept of dog, isn't simply a, a one concept. The concept of dog is also a, a, associated with living, right? I mentioned that. And the concept of dog is associated with, with um, uh, non-human. Okay? So by the time we learn dog, we have learned or we need to learn the concept of non-human and the concept of, of living. And only after we learn non-human and living are we able to comprehend what a dog is. It's a, it's a living thing that is non-human. Right? And so because we've learned those other concepts, the concept of dog is tied into the concept of living and non-human. And therefore, when the, this cluster of dog activates, it might actually, in, in this varies, you know, this again is a little bit of speculation, but probably in different people, you know, how much the, the cluster of living activates with dog or doesn't activate with dog might vary from person to person. Because some people might think of a dog as completely living and other people might not think of the living aspect of a dog. They, they know dogs are living, but when they think of a dog, they're not really conscious of the fact that it's living. So this association between living and dog, that's what I'm talking about, is that that's, that, that's another example of how there's variability when we, you know, when we have this region or regions of, of clusters that, that encode dogness, there's variability from person to person. And also just the core, core cluster of dog, you know, let's say a million or a few million um, neurons, that is not going to be in the exact same location. It's going to be, you know, within, within, you know, several million neurons this way and that way. But it's, if you look at it in a gross map of the brain, it will be roughly in the same area from person to person to person that, that we've seen. Um, and in MRI scans, they, they tend to be in a rough, hazy area that's similar to um, for most people.
And that's one of the reasons why a lot of the research is able to use that, exploit that fact, that our concept of, of simple things, common things, tend to reside, localized, be localized within our brain, um, very similar across uh, similar cultures. Um, another aspect is um, that region. Um, would that region get activated when we think of a related animal such as a wolf? And again, I described that when we learn new animals, we're learning them based on other animals and other things that we know about already. Because when we learn about a wolf, um, few people learn about a wolf before a dog, although there are some cultures where th that happens. Um, and, and, and those people and those children, it, you know, this answer would be backwards, whereas, you know, the, uh, the concept of a dog would be associated with the concept of a wolf because they learned wolf first. You know, for example, the, um, the Inuit tribes in, in uh, um, the Canadian uh, north. Um, so for us, we learn dog before wolf. And so for us, the concept of wolf is a related animal. And oftentimes, you know, when we're learning about it, we would see their similarity. And therefore, probably it would be activated partly when we think of it, when we think of a dog, that the extent to which this wolf region would be activated would vary from person to person. And that again depends on your personal experience. Let's say if you're a zookeeper, if you're if you're a, a botanist, or sorry, a, a, a zoologist, if you work with animals, or if you're a veterinarian, right, and you work with with wolves and dogs, then both of those regions would activate, you know, strongly when you think of a dog, because many animals for a veterinary person uh, who is a veterinary would activate strongly because that's their that's their uh, vocation. So again, it depends on the person, but in general, for most people, it would activate a little bit. Some people would activate even more. Um, would it activate for a hyena? Now, most of us, you know, in, in the uh, in North America, hyenas are rare, um, so it would probably not activate. But if you live in Australia, definitely, or other areas of the world where, where hyenas are more common, definitely. Um, so, does that region activate also for the sound of a dog's bark, or only for the image of a dog? So, this is adding complexity to this idea of what does it mean for dog, and, and what does it mean for different parts of our brain to activate. So when we think of an image of a dog, different parts of our brain activate because images arise in, our, in the back of our brain in our occipital area, and, and they also arise in our temporal area. Um, the sound of a dog, or the sounds in general, arise in our temporal lobe primarily. Um, and they, you know, the, the, I'm talking about the primary activation. After the primary activation, once that cluster or those small regions, you know, regions of clusters activate and fully activate, they would throw off cascades, which activate supporting other regions with around our brain. And those secondary and tertiary, et cetera, cascades give us a much more complex and, and real world picture of, of a dog, let's say. So when we have this initial um, activation of dogness, that the idea of a dog popped into our mind somehow, right? Um, and then that might evoke an image of a dog that might evoke the sound of a dog that might evoke a memory of a dog. If we have a pet dog, um, that will evoke, you know, the, the memory of our, of our dog. Um, if that dog is, if we had a pet dog as a child who, who was passed, it would evoke those memories. So the concept of, of the principal um, evocation of the of dog would cascade and allow other uh, concepts to, uh, related concepts to also activate. So the answer to whether that region also activates the sound of a dog or the image of a dog would depend on the context, what you're doing. For example, if your brain, if your mind is busy, let's say you're driving in the middle of a, of, of a busy uh, uh, city and you're having a conversation with a passenger in the car, right? And the, the concept of dog comes up. They say something and the word dog pops up in the, in the conversation. Well, your mind, that region of dog would pop up. But because your mind is active with so many other things, your, you, that concept of dog might very rapidly, but for a very short period of time, activate some other things about dog. For example, if you have a pet dog at home, it might activate the memory and the image of your pet dog at home. But it might be for a very transient milliseconds or a second. And it might be for such a short duration that you're not even, you don't, you're not even aware. This is what we call subconscious activation, that things in our subconscious come to mind. That we're not, it's not conscious. We don't realize that we've thought about our pet at home, our pet dog at home just because we're talking about someone and the concept of dog came in the conversation. But for a fleeting few seconds or a few milliseconds or even a second, um, the more full version of, of our pet dog 
might fill our brain, but then it'll it'll extinguish very quickly because we're we're in a very dynamic situation. We're driving on the road, we need to pay attention, and we're involved in a conversation. So in that example, the concept of a dog would be very restricted because our brain is busy with so many other things and, and obviously it's our safety is involved when we're driving a car. So our, our focus and attention would make sure that that concept of dog doesn't expand. But if we're sitting alone at home and, and either doing nothing or daydreaming, or if we're reading a book and the concept of dog comes up in the story, that might actually cause us to daydream and wander and think about all kinds of other things because there's no nothing else preventing our brain from doing that. Our brain is basically open to any experience and expansion of experience that it normally is capable of. So these are uh, you know, explanations around this, this concept of the universality of how a lot of these um, you know, ideas and, and uh, notions of the physical world and, and uh, you know, ideas that we have, thoughts that we have um, exist in, in, in the world. Um, so um, this around, um, so, so this, sorry, I, I wasn't keeping up with, with the slide, but, but basically on the right side, I'm just adding uh, clarification for um, each of these questions. And I you know, had already enunciated, so um, they should match what, what I explained earlier. Um, so um, the next uh, idea I want to go into is uh, some simple examples of information and thoughts. So for example, a person, a person is a thought, okay? um, but it's, it's a specific type of thought. It's a, it's a person with, with whom we have a relationship. So the thought, may, the thought that comes to mind when we think of a specific person, um, your friend or, or, or uh, you know, dad or, or, or you know, an old teacher from, from uh, school or something, um, it, it, the thought might come around aspects of them, of their behavior. They were a funny person that might come to mind or details about your relationship, how long you knew them, whether you liked them or not, um, you know, uh, what happened, are they still living, where are they? It might evoke all kinds of memories about that person. So the thought of a person can again expand into much many other thoughts, but um, these are the types of things that, that constitute um, thoughts and information about a person, right? Um, how, uh, you know, uh, how they make us feel, you know, the history that we have with that person. Another example of information of thought are specific objects, such as a pencil, a tree, or a person. A person we have relationships with, but a person theoretically is an object in the world. Um, we normally don't think of them as objects, but, you know, they are. They're, they're, they're physical beings who exist. Um, so all of these things are tangible. Um, so the thoughts around objects might, um, might uh, uh, correspond to the tangibility of them, you know, the fact that they are physical in the world. Um, they might, uh, the thought might also be associated with whether I have one of those things or not. Do I have a tree or do I have a pencil or do I have more than one pencils? Um, if it's living or not, well, a tree pencil is not living, a tree is living. Um, did I have a pencil in my past? Did I have a tree in my past? So many, many types of things, you know, many types of thoughts can arise around objects. These are just some examples. Um, and other examples are emotions and feelings. Um, so, for example, the experiences that we've had in, in the past and feelings that we've had in the past around um, situations, people, um, uh, uh, do you feel that uh, emotion right now? Are you feeling it right now or not? Usually you're not, um, but sometimes you might be. Um, is that emotion positive or negative for you? So do you want to get, you know, remove it from your mind or not? So these are all aspects of the information that is present in our, in our mind at any given time. So um, let me actually, let, at this point, let me, let me take a pause. And, and um, if anybody has any questions, um, let's do that. Um, yeah, folks, actually, uh, uh, why don't you stop sharing the screen there for a moment, uh, so, yeah. Sandra, and then uh, folks, go ahead and type exclamation point in the chat if you have any questions. Uh, you don't want to do breakout rooms, do you? Uh, I don't think we need it this time, yeah. OK, um, so uh, go ahead, uh, DLJ. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Got to un, uh, unmute us here. Yeah, no um, problem. You control freak. Yes, uh, pretty much. <laughs> uh, right, the word thought has come up a lot. Um, and I'm thinking to myself, what's a thought in terms of this information system? I was thinking, is it the information system signaling to itself in terms of cues and signals? I'm thinking signal theory here. So, um, yeah, I mean, so 
any kind of information that exists in our brain. And, and again, at the er earlier, uh, some of the earlier slides I talked about, even information that's encoded genetically, any information. Um, so information literally are signals. Um, so signal theory is, is a big part of this. I'm not going into the, I'm not going describing this in a technical way. This is a, a lay audience. So I'm trying to use terms that are more understandable, but basically it is around signals. Any, any way that signals can be encoded in the brain are thoughts. That's a, a broad general. Uh, so that's why emotions are also, um, I'm calling thoughts. Isn't it more than that? Because you being encoded in the brain is one thing that sounds passive. A thought is, strikes me as something act, active. You need to send, receive, don't you? So, so um, when, so any, so it, again, thoughts don't have to be information that's encoded in our brain. Thoughts are simply, um, basically it's energy flowing. So the flowing of energy that's occurring in the brain, that's a thought. Now that flowing of energy may have originated from a memory. It may have been from a, a genetic memory, for example. It may have been from a memory that we learned. It may have been from no memory. It may have been from experiences. For example, we may have seen a hyena for the first time in our life, right? And that would evoke the, the um, pattern of, of uh, activity, electrical activity activations in our brain, which would be a thought. So, so another way to explain it, it's a little more technical, is, is, is a state. A state across a large, and what I mean by large is millions and, and even billions of neurons. It's a state of millions and billions of neurons. That is a, a, a single thought. And state transition, if you understand okay. what a state transition is. I get, yeah, I get what you said. Oh, trans, okay, so I, I need an active word. So it's, the state sounds passive. I need something that's active, otherwise. So, so it's both states. So, so early on when, I, when you know, we're, we had the first question and Mer, uh, uh, um, Madeline asked the question, I, I elaborated that there's a little more detail around it. It's not simply the physical nature of the interconnection between the neurons. It's also the temporal, the time-based changes between those. Right, so that makes it is, sense. It is, um, act, yeah, activation, the, the state changes are a very important part of it. That's something I don't go into too much because it's much more complicated for people who aren't familiar with it, but it's a very important part of this, is the changing dynamic nature of our thoughts are not static. Our thoughts automatically, we can't help it. They automatically change from one to another. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Vanessa. Okay, what about if you have kind of a constant, repetitive, very limited exposure to something, let's say a dog, you're only, you've only seen like chihuahuas and like the ankle biters, and then you come across something like a bull mastiff or a Newfoundland, might that have a different like impact almost like, okay, it's in the same area, but it's like, okay, you see, uh, it's all green for let's say the cute dog, and then maybe it's red or different colors are similar like with produce if you got like the teeny little pumpkins that you put on the desk and then suddenly you see a pumpkin that you know can hardly fit in a wheelbarrow is yeah, there like uh, a significant difference at least it may be how it's imprinted even if it's in the same locale yeah, great great question Vanessa so um so let me yeah let me expand on this a little bit so so when, we're, when I was describing the concept of a, of a, a single or a few small clusters of, 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 of you know many neurons, millions of neurons that encode dogness. Um, and, and at that time, I also said that if you think about it, dogness, think of it as a noun. And then we also, in our languages, we have concepts of, of adjectives and adverbs. So our brain also encodes in a similar way. So the main concept of a dog would be dog. Okay? And if you're taught that this, this, uh, this new breed, a mastiff that you've never seen before, let's say, right, is a dog, someone has to tell you it's a dog. You have to be trained. You have to learn that this is a dog, even though intuitively you might see it, see it for the first time and you might kind of say it looks like a dog. Ultimately, you're guessing at up to that point until someone tells you it is a dog. And once someone tells you it is a dog, that's when the actual learning starts to happen. And that's when you start to add these adjectives around this specific type of new dog. Um, and the adjectives might be um, the extent of uh, furriness that it has. So, for example, some dogs don't have fur or they don't shed. So around the concept of a dog, there are many, many adjectives and adverbs that we encode. So for example, the color of its coat, okay, the size of its body, the speed at which it moves, its temperament, right? 
some dogs are very cuddly, other dogs are very um, distant and, and they're, they're more independent. So all of these aspects, even emotional aspects of dogs, these are also encoded as part of, they're not the primary encoder. They, they are secondarily and sometimes even tertiarily tied to this core concept of dog, but they are tied into that, that cluster, the, you know, those few clusters of dogness. Um, so there are many, many things around dogness that, that can be tied, you know, all of the things they can imagine. So I mentioned color, I mentioned temperament, I mentioned size, I mentioned the type of coat and the, the, the hair and the furriness of it. Um, it's, it's preference for food, um, where it lives, if it lives in your general locale or if it's a special breed. Um, you know, anything and everything that we know about about dogs can be encoded in the brain, but it would be encoded at a secondary level or tertiary or quaternary level, you know, higher uh, distant levels from the main cluster of dogness. And that gets into how much of an expert we are with dogs. Most of us are not experts with dogs, so we don't encode much more than just the simple things about dogs. But people who are truly experts, um, they would encode vast amounts of information. All of that would be tied in, in in intricate patterns to that main concept of dogness. And so there, um, uh, you know, if someone is an expert of, on dog, that core uh, cluster of dogness probably will be larger for that person than, than the average person. Uh, do we have anybody else that would like to ask a question? If not, I can go ahead. I just saw a comment from Matt, uh, <laughs> which made me chuckle <laughs> in the chat. It's always good to I, meditate. I'm dogs. always, in, you know, one of the things that I'm most interested in is that if they're able to identify a thought or, you know, these ideas of dogness and everything, how does this, relate to behavior like uh, how does it manifest like itself how do we relate thoughts to behavior that's what i'm kind of interested in are you going to talk about that a little bit um so yeah so we will get into a little bit of that um so i mean they they can we can measure gross thoughts gross uh gross uh simple thoughts objects for example can be measured um there are other types of thoughts that we can um uh, uh, you know, we, we, we are starting to learn about. There are many types of experiences that are still ongoing. So um, the interactions between these thoughts are an area of very complex research, which is much more difficult, um, especially when we're dealing with emotions, because emotions tend to be much more fast moving in a sense, um, and they change much more rapidly. Um, you know, the, the, there's a saying that emotions, a typical emotion will stay within us between uh, 10 and 30 seconds at most and it automatically extinguishes within that time, unless there's something in our mind that keeps activating it, keeps bringing it back. Um, and that's, you know, that's an area of psychology, but you know, that, that's an aspect that we see in the neuroscience that a lot of these thoughts automatically die down. This is, you know, we talked about the temporal aspect of thoughts, that the dynamic nature that thoughts are, um, the state change from one uh, thought state to the next is a constant uh, occurrence. So um, when we're talking about the, um, the way that thoughts transition and how uh, the dynamics nature of how people think and behave in the world. Uh, we move from thoughts that pertain to the physical world around us, while simultaneously we also have thoughts about our inner world and the interplay between our inner world thoughts. For example, what did I, what do I have to do, um, you know, in a couple of hours today, right? That's part of our inner world and something that I'm planning to do in a couple of days or something that may be happening at work or there may be a relationship that I'm in that has some issues um, or, or some specifics. And all of these things are part of our inner world and they're always in our mind. And the things that we're interacting with at any given time, any given instant, that's part of our uh, the moment that we're living in. And they, they interact, they, they play together and they affect each other back and forth. So if our inner world is very rich and complex, we have many, many things going on in our lives. And the people that we're interacting with right now, um, we uh, see and, and experience and talk with. Well, if there are very complicated things happening in our inner world, that will sometimes intervene and actually come out into our interaction with people. So for example, this concept of a Freudian slip, right? Everybody's right. heard of what it is. And that's an example where what happens is the, our inner world is so dynamic and and so charged, there's so much active energy involved. You know, again, these thoughts are energy. They're energy that's moving. 
So if the energy around something of a relationship, let's say, or something that's happening in your life is so strong, that energy will intervene in the conversation we're having with someone else. And it might change a word that, that we're trying to say, that word might change into a different word and come out as a Freudian slip. And that's actually what happens. And that's one of the reasons why it's believed that Freudian slips seem to be appropriate because they seem to reveal things that our mind is de are dealing with at the moment. Um, so that's that's an example of the dynamic interplay of, of thoughts within our mind. That's always happening. You know, even when we're dreaming and sleeping, our mind is doing all of that, except it's not consciously doing it. It's a lot of that's happening subconsciously, but it's still doing similar things even even in dream states. Just uh, one really quick question, because I thought it was fascinating to see in one of the videos is this idea we were talking about. And the reason I brought up behavior is one of the things is uh, they thought that they could actually capture things, not only thoughts, but like things like hypocrisy, you know, that things along those lines. So yeah. that, you know, how do you, how do, that's something that is a behavior, but they are saying they're, they can isolate the thoughts that are associated with that behavior. Right. So one of the things that, that um, in, in the video, if you remember, what they talked about is that hypocrisy of certain types of more complex emotions are a little less exact in how we can measure them right now. I mean, maybe in the future we'll be able to measure them better, but um, right now they're not as, uh, not as exact and, and they're not as precise. And that may be because they don't exist spatially and temporally in our brain in the way that other things do, simple things do, because they're so much more dynamic and they, they exist for such a shorter period of time, or they, they may exist at a much broader level within our brain. That our current tools aren't able to see, um, you, know, uh, you know, for example, our, our, you know, a lot of the, the research is being done using MRIs. And M MRIs will pick up uh, signal only if you have a, you know, a small voxel that, that actually is active. And a voxel is, is basically, you know, 10,000, 100,000 uh, neurons, depending on the type of neuron, depending on where it is in the brain. Um, so a voxel is a minimum number of neurons that it will pick up. And if the majority of those neurons, half of those, let's say, are active, then the voxel will be uh, active. So um, there is there's a resolution aspect. You know, there, there are many, many aspects to our ability to measure parts of our brain and, and things in our brain, behavior in our brain. So that's a whole side of it which I don't want to go into right now, but that affects our inability to measure things like hypocrisy. It's not that, that hypocrisy um, is probably not in our brain or, or exists in different ways. It probably exists in similar ways, but right now we don't have, or the tools that we have aren't able to measure them because, probably because they're faster moving or they're spread out over more region of the brain and each uh, cluster is smaller, so therefore we don't see very large clusters, although we do see clusters I mean, with many emotions, including hypocrisy. They did find clusters, but the clusters were more diffuse. And that's what, I'm, what I mean is that when information starts to get become diffuse or very fast moving, it becomes difficult today for us to detect. And that that is the limit at which we can operate today in, in neurosciences. But future tools will allow us to do more of that. And especially as we develop our understanding of how these thoughts change from one to the next. Um, and we start, and, and the models that we have of thoughts become dynamic. Right now, a lot of the models aren't dynamics. For example, all of the videos that, we, that I posted, most of the research still talk about them as if they're static. The concept of a hammer is static. The reality is when the person was sitting in an MRI and they were told to, to think of a hammer, right. they thought of a hammer, but that hammer eventually disappeared from their mind. And they didn't have to force it out. It automatically disappears because the thoughts automatically disappear from us. It, it, this is the nature of our mind. Um, and, and, but, but the researchers never said that. They know that this happens. And that's one of the aspects around this is that we know that this is the nature of our mind, that it is not uh, static, it is temporal, and it, it's fleeting. You know, many thoughts are fleeting. Most thoughts are fleeting. Um, but researchers, when we communicate, and we, the models that we have, the scientific models, don't capture the full extent of that yet. I and mean, we understand it thinking-wise. But the mathematical communications that we have around it don't capture that fully. Thank you. Uh, DLJ has one more question, and well, I guess we'll get back to the presentations. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'm getting the idea of the learning set. So you, there was a comment on one of the slides about you've got to 
have an awareness or some exposure to dog to be able to then see dog or pattern or colors of dogs and so on um does that rule out you well you've got eureka moments right which presumably are sudden realization of combinations of thoughts but does that completely rule out innovation as in from nowhere hmm. so it depends on what you call innovation i don't think innovation occurs from nowhere because innovation right. if you if you think innovation is really a combination of our past experiences right for example well, that's the, that's what i'm asking so given that that's what we're implying here that seems to rule out it, it, yeah it seems to be that innovation can only be pat, sudden realization of patterns that must be there already right Right. So I'll get, I'll get two examples. Set, yeah? Right. Right. So I'll get right. two examples of concepts that we find extremely difficult to deal with. Okay. So we all have heard about, most of us have heard about the Big Bang, right? But the concept of that time did not exist before the Big Bang, right? That concept of time not existing is outside the realm of our ability to understand. It's, it's most of us, none of us, you know, the, 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 the best scientists also admit this. It's we, we cannot fathom what it means for time not to exist. And, and that's, you know, my nature, because we only we have only lived in time. We have only lived in the flowing fluid nature of time. We can't imagine if time uh, I mean, we can imagine time moving backward, for example. We can imagine time moving more slowly, but we cannot imagine where time doesn't exist. Well, the only way that we can imagine time is a freeze frame, right? Everything's frozen in time. That's the only concept we can have of, of, of timelessness. But that's not what, you know, pre-Big Bang is. It's not about timelessness. It's about the concept of time didn't exist, which is different from time frozen. And that concept is not possible for you. Another example is thinking or imagining something as a seven or eight dimensional figure. We cannot do it, right? Because it is not in our realm. Our brain has never seen seven dimensional or eight dimensional figure and therefore we cannot imagine it we cannot deal with that it's just blah it just goes away nobody can and that's the reason why those, those are the concepts i'm talking about and that's the reason why we talk about imagination creativity that's a real thing but it's based on only those things that we've already experienced and that's the reason why the newer concepts the novel concepts the eureka moments are you can always tie a thread to something from your past that is related to it Great question, yeah. So let, let's uh, go back to the, the slides. We have some more. Um, are we sure time didn't exist? So, well, we don't know, that, but I'm not going to go into, into that. I mean, we don't know exactly what happened before the Big Bang, but the concept is that um, we, uh, you know, we don't know how to expound on this notion of no timeless, you know, time doesn't exist. So, um, let me uh, so let me start. So we're actually transitioning into um, the question that Joe asked um, about uh, hypocrisy and the I think not hypo yeah, hypocrisy. So there was a study that um, in uh, one of the videos uh, they talked about, and I just want to go a little bit more, more into that. Um, and so the uh, two researchers, uh, Marcel Jest and Tom Mitchell, um, and they, they, they're they're very uh, uh, strong researchers in this area. There are several others that. Uh, are, are very good at this. There's a study they did in, I think, 2007, published 2008, and they, um, what they did is they, they wanted to look at um, the, uh, um, way that uh, specific thoughts are, uh, occur in people's minds, uh, people from all backgrounds, people from all, um, uh, you know, multilingual people with other languages, people from different age groups, but um, uh, so they took, uh, I, I don't remember the exact number of people, but they took a, a, a cohort um, for the study and they gave them um, specific um, words to think about. And they, to and they told them to um, think about, imagine, uh, you know, people behaving in certain ways with them. Uh, and, and these there were keywords that they were told. And the keywords fell into four different categories either physical actions or symbolic actions, and either positive physical actions, negative physical actions, or positive symbolic actions or negative symbolic actions. And there were six of each, so there were 24 words in total. And when they did this, they had each of the subjects 
study participants in an MRI scanner, and they scan their brains um, throughout this as they're imagining and, and, and uh, you know, thinking about the, the single word. They told them to do a single word at a time. And there were other, other things that they did in the study to, to the controls that are necessary to kind of clear the slate so that their mind is still at a, at a resting state so that the one word doesn't interfere with the next word that comes to mind. So, because if they're given one word, you don't want the next word to be, um, you know, interfered with. If, if, for example, if you give one word that's negative and the next word is positive, you, you don't want the effects of that ne negative word to interfere with the positive word. So they did, did different things in the study. And these words were randomized, but they were also done in a certain pattern so that they could find any, um, they removed a lot of the biases in the study. Um, you know, there's a, a whole way of the experiments have to be designed uh, appropriately. So in this study, um, what they did is they, they looked at this and, and across all of the subjects, what they found is that there were specific regions of the brain that encoded for these types of concepts, these types of thoughts or emotions. Um, and what they found is that most of these were encoded in very similar regions within the brain across most people, across most of the participants. And not all, but it was close enough. I think the percentage was around 60, 70%. Actually, this study was 70 to 80% for most people, which is for a study, like it's, it's fairly high. And, and you have to remember that the way that they're doing it, there, there's, a, there's a, a neural network tool that they're using to do this. So there's training involved in neural network is a part of it, which adds to error in, in how the study works. And that's Tom Mitchell was an expert in that area also. So that's why he was involved in this. So that actually is one of the reasons why the, it's believed the percentage wasn't higher because that tool that they had wasn't as sophisticated. This is again, uh, you know, many, uh, 14 years ago. So 14 years in, in uh, uh, machine learning was, is, a, is a huge life, lifetime. Uh, the tools of machine learning at that time were not as developed as they are today. Um, so at that time, that tool was not as sophisticated and it did not give them the certainty that, that uh, if they repeated this today, it, it would have given them. But still for that time, in the 70 to 80% was, was very demonstrative, it showed. Now, what they also saw was that many of these thoughts and emotions, which were not very strong and very common. So for example, hypocrisy um, was found to be not as easy to um, find commonality between all the studies, although there was enough. It wasn't like there was none. There was enough commonality. It wasn't as high as the others. Um, and other concepts like love. Love was something that was very strongly correlated across almost everybody. And again, we realize that because almost everybody has felt love. You know, as a child, we feel loved by people, you know, parents, caregivers, by our friends. Um, and so love is a universal feeling that we have visceral, we have very strong um, sensations around and concepts around. And therefore, you know, there was, but, but interestingly enough, the region where it was encoded was also very similar. And part of the region was probably because Feelings like love are not simply um, intangible ideas. They actually are physically present because our, you know, we, we have experiences of our heart rate changing based on feelings of love and hate, right? Um, our uh, digestive system, we can have butterflies in our stomach, either positive butterflies or negative butterflies, right? Feeling of, of nausea, depending on if we hate someone or love someone. So our physical body actually changes sensation and states. But again, those sensations are changing in our brain Partly in our body, we have neurons in our body also, but those neurons tied to our brain neurons together are changing our state, which gives us these sensations of a lot of these strong visceral emotions. So love is one of those emotions which is very visceral. And, pro and, and the region where, I, I don't remember exactly, I don't, I, the, I, the study didn't go into detail, but um, it's, you know, my, my guess is that the region for where love was encoded is probably not that distant from where we include a lot of visceral sensations in our in our body because love is a very visceral sensation. And that may be, now it may not, it doesn't necessarily have to be physically in, in spatial proximity close to that region for visceral processing. But it does have to, in terms of the network, in terms of the connections of the network, the connection has to be very close and very fast. That's the key point here. It doesn't have to be physically proximally um, adjacent, but it needs to be the, the signal between those visceral sensations and the sensation of love have to move between each other very rapidly and has to be a very um, wide bandwidth, meaning lots of information needs to be able to flow between these two regions. So that would tie them together. Again, it doesn't have to be physically approximately uh, you know, adjacent or close by, but the information, the um, amount of information, the speed at which information can flow between them 
has to be um, heightened. Um, so that's that's the idea. So the key idea here is that yes, all the physical actions were found to be very very similar in most people, and symbolic actions also were found to be very similar in, in people. Um, so this is something that we talked about earlier. So there's another. So now I'm going to do an, uh, an example that I want to talk about. This is kind of going to, going to tie a lot of the ideas together with um, what we talked about and try to. But but so when we think of dogness, okay, and I'm using the same example. I'm sorry if if someone doesn't like it, but this is this is what I have. Um, and um, so the idea of a dog might start off with with the concept of a dog being an animal. Okay. And there might be, uh, and in this example, I, I have three different regions, but one of these is smaller than the other two. So it might be that the concept of, of dogness actually starts with the first two regions, these large two regions. That's the main one that encodes dogness. Or, or sorry, one of these regions encodes dogness. Let's say that this uppermost one encodes dogness. And the second one and the third one together, all three of these together encode animal. Okay. Um, and again, what, what I mean by this cluster is that, again, there may be millions or even billions of neurons because these large enough regions can encode billions, have billions of neurons. That's how large this region is. Um, um, so these three clusters together may together encode the concept of an animal. And then we may have other concepts, these two other uh, clusters tied with this original cluster. These three clusters on the left may encode the concept of canine. So canine is actually where the, what, what is really a dog, but you know these these five together may be the core construct of what we encode as a dog, right? Um, and then we may have a concept of a real. So a dog is a real object, right? It's a real entity. It's not imagined. It's not, for example, artwork or something that's imaginary, like the Mona Lisa is artwork, right? The physical artwork is real, but the person in the Mona Lisa is imagined. Um, although the subject, you know, we believe um, was painted uh, by a, a real subject, but the dogs are real things. So there's also this concept of realness that our brain would encode. And for most things that our brain encodes, our brain does encode whether it's a real thing or not, whether it's, um, and it, it sort of is, is, it's not the same as, but it's sort of, you can think of it as a concept of tangibleness. Is it tangible? Is it physical in the world or not? It's not exactly that. It's more along the lines of the imaginary. Is it something that's imaginary or not? Is it dreamlike or not? Um, then we might have another uh, encoding of, of regions that encode. Is it known to me or not? Meaning, do I know this dog or not? Okay. Or do you know? Remember that earlier at the beginning, I said that everything in our brain, the types of things we're talking about, comes from a very selfish perspective. We're talking about the id, right? This this is an aspect that demonstrates that our brain at this level, at this primitive level of functioning really treats the world as ours. We see everything from our own personal perspective. I talked about the apple, the crunchiness, at my mouth and my apple, right? So when we think of dog, we think of, is it my dog? Okay, is it known to me or not? And this is, in this example, um, later on we're gonna see, but but yes, the person, the person whose brain I'm, I'm giving this example of actually is a dog owner and they have their own dog. And so um, you'll see that the name of the dog actually would pop up in this also. So then there, there's there's the concept of from my past, okay, in the past. So it, so again, this person is thinking of dog from their past. So in the situation that they're in, again, we gave a hypothetical example where you're driving in a car, you're having a conversation with the pastor next to you, and the, the concept of dog arose. So the concept of dog arose. So the concept of dog from your past is the concept is not about a dog from your past. And you're a pet owner, you have a dog who's at home. So you remember, your mind would, for a fleeting second, might remember your dog. And your dog is not from the past, your, your dog is from the present. So this concept of dog from the past, I highlighted as, neg as red clusters, three clusters. And what that constitutes is that those are inactivated, meaning that the concept of dog in this situation, so again, what now what we're doing is we're getting into the adjectives of dogness. Okay, we have the core definition of dog already there, and now this person, because they're having a conversation with this person in the car, they're having more additional complex layers added on to dogness that they're realizing. So the concept of a dog that they're talking about now is about a dog not from their past. So there are certain regions of their brain which are activating negativeness that is not from their past. Okay. So this is a key concept also to understand is that our mind also encodes thoughts that inhibit other thoughts 
where they negate other thoughts. This is very important. Now, we've talked about this a little bit, but I haven't gotten more detail, and, and there's more details of this that we might go into later, but right now I'm just introducing a little more of this, that the negation of thoughts or the negation of sensation or the negation of information flow, the negation of energy, dynamic energy flow within the brain. This is a very important concept also. That's, that's important. And then another aspect of this may be that um, the, um, sorry, um, so, you know, and, and uh, many, many uh, ideas would, would come to mind. You know. So, for example, um, you may come, you know, the, the idea of, of a dog is part of your family, if they're a companion, that the breed of dog that you have, remember, this is a dog owner, uh, is a Labrador. Um, and the name of the dog is Loki. Um, so all of these concepts would also pop into their head, secondarily, tertiarily. Okay, as soon as the core concept of the dog popped into their head, all of these other concepts within a few milliseconds, within a second, about a second, all these other concepts would activate within their mind. Um, the concept of a furry, because dogs are furry. The, their dog, they have a fun relationship with their dog. Their dog is fast, very playful. So these concepts also come in, but these concepts, and, and the green and red and, and black are just aspects of whether these uh, regions are activating other regions or activating uh, comp together in a, in a confluence or not. That's what the color denotes here. The, you know, the, the idea I'm trying to present is very, very complicated and it's very difficult to present because it's more than three dimensions and I can't present it in two dimensions. So I'm trying to, you know, use color and space to show that. And, and you know, the verbal de definition I'm trying to use hopefully will help to explain that. Um, and then there, there's some other layers um, around it. So for example, Lots and lots of other examples. So um, when you think of a dog, there are many breeds of dogs, Akita, Kali, Hound, Husky, Pit Bull. Right? Those are breeds of dogs. So those breeds of dogs are not my dog, right? So those, dog, those breeds of dogs would also activate in the person's mind because they are dogs. And because this person is thinking of a dog, but those activations would be, those are those light gray regions in here. And those regions are dimly activated. They're not very strongly activated because my dog is not any of those breeds. And probably in the conversation that we're having, the person that, that mentioned it, they did not mention any of those breeds, or the, the dog that we're talking about is not any one of those breeds. So the real-time nature of what activates in a person's mind when they have a thought of a specific dog, that's what we're elaborating here. Other things that would pop up are colors, because dogs tend to be colored, right? But they are not yellow, they are not red, although they can be reddish, they can be reddish brown, but they're not red. They're not orange, green, blue. Um, so those regions also are gray. Um, they're not a tool. I mean, you can think of, but dogs are not a tool. Um, they're not a vehicle. Um, so there are red regions in here that which I deactivate. Um, there are names of, of animals, Nemo and Checkers. Those are Nemo is not the name of a common dog. It's the name of a, of a movie character. A checkers is the name of a famous dog, but that's not my dog. So these are, are larger gray regions. So all of these things are basically showing the types of regions, multiple regions would, that would activate within our brain um, when, during a conversation, the concept of a dog or a specific dog pops up. Now, in this example, the specific dog that was in the conversation was not my pet dog, was not the, the, dog, the pet dog of the person who owns the dog. It was a dog related to, let's say, a story that they're talking about or some, some other the issue. Okay, So the state of the brain that pops up in the listener's mind would be around that dog but it would also be merged in with their own personal dog. Because remember, everything in the world is personal. So this person knows they have their personal dog. So their personal dog, so down at the bottom here, these aspects of the personal dog also popped in simultaneously. They couldn't help it, right? This is what happens to our brain. This is one of the reasons why subconsciously things automatically happen in the brain. We can't help it. We can't stop them oftentimes because that's the nature of it. Um, things that are personal to us, especially if they're very personal and emotional, if they have strong emotional balance, if they have strong emotional energy in us, um, they automatically pop up. So that's the reason why family companion Loki, Loki is the name of the dog. That's why that popped up very strongly in a green positive reinforcing way, because for this person, even though the conversation is not about their personal dog, Loki, their personal dog still popped in their head for a fleeting moment. And then within a few seconds, this will, this dynamic picture will change it will, so that's another aspect that I can't change because animation is complicated to make. I didn't have the time to make this into a, a fluid animation. I'm just showing the first instance of it as it evolved over the first you know, one or two seconds. But after four or five or eight seconds, 
it will continue to change and certain aspects of these will disappear. And then other aspects as, as the person who we're talking with sitting in the car, the story continues, other things that they're talking about in the story will come into mind. And this aspect of dogness will disappear from our mind because those other aspects of the story will continue and take over. So these are all important in, in how ideas emerge and originate and transform and, and disappear in our mind. Um, and, and they merge with other ideas and how one idea and one thought and one emotion um, transposes and, and uh, basically translates into another related and, and eventually unrelated uh, thought and idea. So something else that um, um, I wanted to present is this idea of what's known as a word cloud. Now, some, uh, I, hope, I think everybody probably has heard of what a word cloud is. A word cloud we've seen is basically, it's like a little uh, image of uh, certain words, right, all put together. And the words, uh, some words are larger than others, and sometimes word clouds have color also. In this case, I've used color, excuse me, color encoding to encode it. But a very simple, it's not completely accurate, but it's roughly accurate enough that it'll, it'll give us a positive understanding of, of how our brain functions. A roughly accurate way, a simplistic but accurate way of thinking about how our brain represents ideas and thoughts is as a word cloud. And one of the videos that I linked to actually goes into that. Um, and again, it is not completely accurate because again, it's a word cloud that's changing over time. That's a word cloud where um, you know, in a simple word cloud, everything is static, but in the real brain, everything is not static. Some of these ideas would pop up immediately and stay for a long time. Other ideas, for example, this idea from my past might pop up initially and then it will disappear. While other things keep popping up, like the family and, and companion, Labrador and real, those things might pop up and stay for a longer time. While this from my past concept might disappear, it might pop up instantly and disappear very rapidly. So this word cloud is a very dynamic word cloud. And also this concept of, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, it, 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 it will be changing and there will be other concepts simultaneous to this. So for example, in, in the example that I cited, the person is driving, so not too many other ideas would pop into their mind. But the other example I gave was if you're sitting you know, at home reading a book and your idea of your pet uh, dog comes into mind. Well, your mind is basically free. It doesn't have too many other things going on. So many other thoughts and ideas would pop into your mind. So in that situation, this word cloud also would have other word clouds superimposed on top of each other simultaneously. That's an important idea, aspect to understand is that our mind, this is the reason why our mind is able to hold more than one thought, more than one emotion simultaneously. That's a very, and, and some of those thoughts remain for longer, other thoughts disappear very quickly, and other thoughts cause, cascade, evoke, actuate other thoughts you know, from, from them because they, they hold a lot of positive energy or negative energy within our mind or within our current state of mind. So these are all aspects around thought and how information is, is uh, you know, stays within our mind and exists within our mind. Now, another aspect that I didn't go into and that, that let me go into a little bit is that, let me just backtrack and go into, um, so just th this uh, initial um, image uh, with all of these dots. So the reason why this image is there is because a lot of researchers have done this and this research has been going on for, for close to 20 years. It's, it's, it's long-term, it's, it's no longer just uh, you know, recent stuff. There, there's a whole lot of research behind this. What they found is that for specific types of ideas, and they looked into very simple things right now, they looked into physical objects and they looked into simple emotions, um, and they're starting to do more complicated combinations of these. Um, and for the simple objects, what they found is that, yes, there are simple distinct regions. Again, you know, in this case, this, this is, is, let me step back a little bit and show just the, the core dog. Okay. So this is, let's say the core dog. Right? So what they found is that this actually happens in the real world, that most people who have, and I'm not saying that these locations are exactly where the concept of dog would exist in the in, in real, this is just hypothetically you know, an example that I chose, but it, wherever it happens to be in, in one person, chances are high that that's where it exists regionally. So for example, if it exists in this in this region, chances are high that it would be within around this area and around the second area in almost everybody who has experienced dogs in a similar cultural way. Um, and that's what they found. So for physical objects as well as for people, this, this is, is true. Um, there's a lot of commonality. Um, and this happens independent of 
the languages that the people speak. This happens independent of the age of the person. This happens independent of how they learned. Um, uh, I mean, most of the concepts that they're talking about, these people have learned in similar ways. Um, they didn't explore situations where somebody has never met a dog before, because that, that's an unusual situation. Um, but, you know, they, 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 they involve people who all of them dealt with uh, the concepts that they that were studying it. Another thing that they did in the study is that, and I didn't go into the slides, but, but I'm going to talk about it, is that they looked at categories of information. So, for example, physical objects. Now, early in the talk, I, I talked about our body and the nature that we see the world in terms of our personal, how it relates to us. We are, in a sense, selfish. Our brain thinks in a selfish way. So what they saw is that pretty much every object that they found an association with, part of the association, part of the activated region for that object included, um, and so let me let me actually clarify. So in, in, in the, um, the border between the, uh, so I'm going to move my mouse, so hopefully you can all see it. There's a region in this topmost area of our brain, of the dorsal area, um, and it's, it's on the right edge, the uh, um, anterior edge of the frontal lobe. Frontal lobe is in the front here, and it's the anterior, the front edge of the uh, parietal lobe. So there are two actual very, very um, thin but very important regions of our brain. Um, and these regions of our brain are very interesting because both of them, one, the one on the left encodes basically our entire body, right? But it encodes our entire body in terms of the muscles in our body and our movement in our body, right? And the one on the right encodes our entire body, but it encodes the sensations and the perceptions of the, and the sensors in our body. So, for example, in our, in our skin, we have sensors all over, right? We have sensors of, of temperature. We have sensors of, of olfactory odor, you know, odor sensation. We have sweat glands. So all of these sensors and actuators in our body are encoded in these two regions in our brain, right? Um, and what they found is that pretty much everything that's physical in the world, at least these common objects that they studied, all of these physically common objects, when they're encoded in our brain, they're also encoded along with how they interact with our body. So for example, an apple is encoded with our mouth and with our tongue because our mouth and tongue are required aspects of appleness, of, of using an apple, of chewing an apple, of eating an apple, and even our stomach to some extent because we're an apple. Although, you know, we don't know cognitively consciously that our stomach goes into it, but stomach is both. So, and, and, and likewise, a hammer, we hit a hammer with our hand. And if you're right-handed, it tends to be toward your, and, and, and this, this, these two regions, there's a term called humalong, humalongus. It's a very odd term, but that's a very specific term in the neuroscience, um, which describes this. It, it's actually, the region is very, very, and from, from perspective of pattern, it almost identically matches the pattern of um, sensory receptors, both actuators and sensors in our body. And so, for example, at, at one end is, our feet, and the other end is our head, our nose, uh, um, and eyes, and everything in between maps almost directly, and our hands are somewhere in the middle. But also the number of neurons that are that are associated with each region, for example, our hands, depend on the amount of sensation or the amount of control that we have. So for example, our hands are very, very important to us as beings. So when we have very high dexterity in our ability to move our hands and thumbs, Right, and same with our tongue. Um, we have a lot of sensors in our tongue and, and olf uh, olfactory, our nose, and we have a lot of precision and the ability to move our tongue. That's the reason we have sophisticated language and the ability to speak with the, all these sounds. And so the region for our tongue and the region for our hands have are much much larger than anything else than most of the other things in, in, in these human guide, these two regions in our brain. So so what what we saw what what they saw is that the encoding of objects, simple objects in the, in, in, our, in the world that we're able to interact with are also encoded as part of the part of our body which is used or necessary or important to, uh, to uh, uh, interact with that object. Um, and this is a pattern that's there. What they also saw is that there's a region in the brain which encodes for um, uh, um, uh, enclosure or, um, uh, or uh, like the concept of a house, concept of comfort or safety, 
okay, these concepts. It encodes this concept of an enclosure, and that is is a is a is a region or those small regions together are always associated with objects, physical objects, which provide some type of enclosure. For example, a closet, or a car, or a house, or a building. These are all objects which can provide shelter to us. And so whenever we have the conceptualization of an idea, like a building or a school, they also have activated as part of them that, that area that is the quote unquote shelter area or the enclosure area of our brain. Um, so this is something that's also important to understand that our brain has these core, um, you can say a catalog of categories of objects in the world. Um, which it encodes. So, for example, when in this, I when I encoded the, the concept of real, real is another real versus imaginary. That's another one of those that that's there. Um, where is it a real object or is it an imagined object or is it something that's imaginary to me? So these are just examples of, of concepts and encoding of information within our brain. So let me stop here. Um, and what we'll do is we'll do some questions and answers if people want. We can also have um, closing thoughts if people want. So let me close here um, and. Um, Go back to uh, to the um, the main screen. So Joe, you're you're muted. Hi. Hi, Sanjay. Oh, hi, Shikant. How are you? I am doing well. I am doing well. So I will. Um, so we are ready for Q and A, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We, we um, did one already, but yeah, this is a, this is a okay. So this is the final Q and A. So uh, you can talk about your impressions, you know, what you got from this talk for a little while, maybe a minute or so, and then you're also welcome to put the question. So just line up. We want to hear all the comments, all the questions. Let's put everything on the table from you, and then we will take it from there. All right. So folks, go ahead and type an exclamation mark if you would like to make a short comment. And or ask questions. We'll start with Vanessa. Vanessa, what did you what did you get from this uh, presentation, and what are your questions? Oh, I found it quite interesting. Um, and I do like your display with the brain and just showing the different circles and the colors and the dots kind of just where that may be encoded. Now, maybe for a future discussion, um, it mentioned those studies, uh, like, you know, showing a hammer briefly. Do you see them going down the future where maybe being deceptive, like saying the sound of a hammer and let's say you hear a diesel horn or something to see if that, you know, you get a little flash saying, wait a minute, whether it shows confusion or unexpected or somehow it's encoded differently when it is either you know you may be deceived or something like that you see those studies going forward or something what, like that so about uh, deception and you know, misinterpretation what wonderful thank you thank you vanessa next up is going to be joe followed by ella joe yeah i thought that this was a you know one of your best presentations yet uh sanjay um, I mean, I thought that this was very good as far as, you know, kind of giving us the visuals as to what thoughts like and how they interact, how we process them, what they are, how they work in with periods of time. And, and so I really appreciated that. Um, there were a couple of things, actually, I, I found, you know, I was wondering if we could maybe explore that you're in the sources uh, that were in the sources that you're posted is that. And one of those ideas was this idea of neuromarketing. And, you know, I thought that that was interesting. And I was wondering if you could offer your thoughts on essentially what that exactly the potential for that and even how that would work. What is the process for that? I didn't, the one part they did mention is they talked about neuromarketing, but they didn't exactly talk about how it worked. They could, they would talk about how they could locate an idea specific in your mind, but doesn't mean, again, doesn't mean it would, you would be taking an action on that. So if you could explain that process, I thought that that was pretty fascinating. Wonderful, on neuromarketing, wonderful. Uh, thank you, thank you, Joe. Uh, next up is Ella. 
Ella, go ahead. Um, yes, thank you so much, Sanjay. Um, I have a couple questions. One is about consciousness and our, our X amount of neurons needed to develop the eye that is um, that higher level of consciousness? Is there an amount or is there a complexity in terms of the, the, the map of neurons that would be required for consciousness? The second part of my question is about if you have organs removed, say the thyroid or part of the um, intestinal system um, due to surgery, then, and they are a part of that, as you had mentioned prior, uh, neuronal network. You have the network uh, in the brain, you have the neurons in the brain, you may have some in the body, in the intestinal system, perhaps other organs. So if those body organs are removed, is that going to affect your brain or your body functions in general? Well, thank you, thank you, Ella. Um, folks, go ahead and type exclamation mark to put your questions or comments. I'm going to add a question. I've been reading uh, Steven Pinker on language and this is how he puts the problem of communication using language. He says, brain is a network. It's a very dense and complex network. You're communicating to another network, which is a dense and complex network. And you're doing it through this line. How is it that an effective line of speaking or writing manage? How does that manage to connect one giant network with another? So that's, that's the question that I had. All right, folks, uh, last chance for putting questions on the table, otherwise we'll go ahead and take, um, take, um, you know, go to the answers. Uh, so first one, let's start with uh, Ella's question on consciousness. Does consciousness require a certain level of complexity of the neural network? What are your thoughts about consciousness and neural network? Um, so, I mean, we've done, I've done a lot of, of talks on consciousness. I'm trying to think of how it, so um, the, I'm trying to think of, of examples that I can give. Um, so the simplest answer to, to what you asked, is there a minimum number of neurons that are needed? We don't really know, but it seems to be the case. Um, it seems to be because from, from the pattern we're seeing as far as all types of animals, all types of living things, um, uh, and, and again, let me uh, clarify that in the field of neuroscience, the concept of consciousness is not simply a one type. So the type of consciousness that you described around the notion of I, of my I-ness and my existence and my um, awareness of myself, that's at the pinnacle, the highest level of consciousness that we talk about. But there are many other types of consciousness which are lower level, which other animals do show. Um, and so what we see is that this hierarchy of consciousness seems to match, um, seems to um, match the progression of the density of neurons, not necessarily the size of, of the brain, but the density of neurons um, in organisms and animals. And below a certain size, we don't see many um, uh, levels of consciousness other than simply brainstem function. Brainstem function is, an, is a part of consciousness because literally you need a brainstem uh, to be conscious, otherwise you're unconscious. Um, so that's the only aspect we see in all of the lower animals. And progressively, as we get higher and higher, and, as, and, and again, in evolution, what we see is that uh, not just evolutionarily, but even embryo embryologically. So as a fetus of any animal, including humans, as the fetus develops, the embryo embryological growth of the brain from the neural tube, and I did talk about this a while back, that also mimics the evolutionary path that all animals took, or at least our descent, our lineage along the tree path, the path of the, of the tree that we took. Our, our uh, growth in the womb, the bra our brain's growth in the womb, mimics that similar path. And we see that 
in the beginning, our brain resembles the brain of certain of those organisms, and then eventually certain regions go on the, at the end, our frontal lobe, uh, our cortex actually, and then the frontal lobe within our cortex is the last area to really flourish. Um, and so looking at all these together, um, pro I mean, I personally believe that yes, consciousness is tied to the number of neurons, but it's not that simple because an infant on the first day they're born has more neurons than adults do. But I believe they have less of a consciousness than adults do. So it's not simply the number of neurons. It's, there's more to it than that. And, and I've talked about this. This is this is something that we're, we're we talk about a lot in this group, and I'm going to continue to. So, um, you know, this is something we'll we'll go into more further later. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, uh, Ella. And I would recommend uh, to you the um, the playlist uh, of neuroscience that. Um, you know, all, all the different meetups that uh, Sanjay has done. Joe, could you do me a favor and put the list there? Uh, this topic has been dealt with in multiple ways in, you know, multiple meetups. Uh, thank you. Uh, next question is, again, Ella's question on removal of an organ. How does removal of an organ impact the brain? Yeah, so great. Um, so yeah, we are, our mind and body are interconnected. Now our body has, has neurons, literally it has neurons. But not every part of our body has the same number and the same uh, extent of neurons. Um, for example, our heart has neurons because our brain needs to sense and it needs to control it. Um, and every muscle, every muscle that our brain connects to. Now, the muscles don't have neurons, but they have precursors to what are uh, similar to um, actuators and sensors. Uh, so, for example, our, our mind is able to sense the position of our body, proprioception is this concept that, not a concept, it's a physical thing that our brain is capable of doing. It's able to literally measure the position of our muscles and our joints and limbs and our in space, even with our eyes completely closed. Even blind people can do that. So it's not based on vision. Um, and so there's our, our body is, is intricately connected into our brain. So if any of that is severed or if organs are removed, those connections are gone. Um, and so, yes, if, if let's say an intestine or part of intestine is cut, we will lose that connection. And whatever the neurons are providing in terms of information to the brain, in terms of ability to the body, um, would be lost. Although it's not completely gone because the, uh, another thing to understand is that our brain, again, I'm going to go into to evolution because that's, that's something that helps us to understand this very well. That in the, our evolutionary timeline as an animal, um, very early on, the brain, actually animals, very simple animals, we had hardly a brain. We had a neural tube, we had, we didn't even have eyes, we had, we had maybe some sensors which picked up light, but it didn't really do any processing. All it did, it was it sensed which, and these were again, when we were um, living in the ocean, we're very simple creatures in the ocean. All we did was sense which way is up, because sunlight peering through from the, from the uh, top of the ocean, gave this blue haze, which these sensors kind of picked up. And it wasn't really, eye. it didn't give us vision, but it gives a sensation of directionality. And then as we uh, evolve more and more, um, the neural tube and, and, and our brain, aspects of our brain, develop more. And we started to have more and more tie into the rest of our body. So one thing to understand is that our body can really function on a to a large extent without our brain. This is the reason why when people are born with defects, severe defects of the brain. They can live functionally, um, they can live comfortably successful lives. It's just the brainstem that has to be the brainstem, critical parts of the brainstem have to be there. As long as that's there, the person can live and most of their body can live. Um, although their ability to perceive, for example, the feeling of hunger, if uh, the nerve that sends that information is cut, is severed, then you won't have that sensation. So it will impact your life, but it doesn't have a drastic effect on our, on our life day to day. Um, from from what we see, wonderful. Um, Joe, did you have? Did you want to add a question? Um, I did, uh, and right now uh, it's oh, it was one that had to do with this idea of how our memories are stored, and they're able to actually identify what is where we've been, what we've done, and. And, uh, you know, they're able to scan our minds to understand, like, if we've been uh, to, say, Paris or something like that, or, you know, things like that. Uh, how does that exactly work? Like, essentially, how are they able to see into 
you know, person's mind as to where they've been. I actually, so that was one of my additional questions because I thought that I was interesting. One of the sources, it's kind of related. Uh, go ahead, uh, Sanjay. You can answer. Yeah. So, so yeah, uh, very good. Uh, that, that question is, is interesting because it was done, it was explained in a subtle way. And actually the person, the, the group that's doing the research, they haven't completed the research, it's so ongoing. I went to the website um, a few days ago and, and, and tried to look at, so th there's a key information which they did talk about, but it was very subtle. And that is that they're actually, when, when they're looking into the other person's brain, they don't, they're, there's, they're not seeing, uh, or the other person, the brain that they're looking into doesn't encode the location of where they've been. Okay? What they're doing is they're showing the person images. Okay, so this is a very important part, that this only works while they're showing the person images. Okay? And it could be video or it can be static images, photos. But they, they have to show the person images. And what they're doing is that if the person has been to a certain place, let's say you've been to Paris, right, and you've seen the Louvre, um, and it doesn't matter which angle you've seen, because basically our brain encodes irrespective of the exact path that we took through the Louvre or, you know, most people have to enter through the same, you know, the top surface, but um, irrespective of, of the path throughout the, the museum or irrespective of where within France, within the first arrondissement you went, you know, you, if, you, if you remember the Louvre, you kind of have a concept mentally of where it is. So when the researchers are probing the person's mind, what they're doing is they're looking at the um, activation of these place neurons. And again, I talked about place neurons. They might not be specific neurons. They might actually be regions. They might actually be clusters of neurons. But they're looking at these clusters for activation. Okay? So when a person sees a photo or a video of the Louvre and they've been there, then these place neurons that associate with the Louvre. Okay? Um, so there's two types. One is that we tend to have place neurons for very specific places that are important to us, for example, our home or our childhood home, right? or the place that we're very familiar with. We tend to have place neurons for those or place clusters for those. Okay? And for other places, we really don't tend to. But we have these other types of neurons, which are like recognition neurons. Like, oh, I've been there. I'm familiar with that place, like familiarity neurons. So what they're doing is they're looking for those familiarity neurons when they're being shown a video or a picture of a place they've already been to. If those, if those familiarity neurons activate, that person's brain is telling us that person's been there because that person is feeling the sensation, like the sensation of deja vu, that's those familiarity neurons coming in. So since deja vu can be a false feeling sometimes, so there's a possibility. And now the research, I don't, it, it's still ongoing, so I don't know why they haven't finished it because it's been ongoing for a few years, but maybe that's a reason why because this concept of deja vu being false sometimes, maybe that's causing some you know, uh, challenges in the study. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, let's take uh, Vanessa's question about deception, possible deception. So that I wasn't sure exactly what um, what you meant, Vanessa. If you want to elaborate, that's, that's okay. okay. Go ahead, Vanessa. Can you restate the question? Yes, it, it dealt with um, how they were showing the, the, you know, the scans hammer, think about a hammer, think about the apartment. Um, do you see them maybe doing studies where, let's say they had acoustics with it, the sound of a hammer, but instead they say picture a hammer and hear like a diesel horn. So something that's not associated with a different sense or imagine a, an apple and in your hand, you feel like a you know a dog's coat or something where like the things are contradictory. Might that, you know, have an abnormal, maybe the same areas would get lit up, but maybe the patterns be different or the intensity may vary or in different area may even fire up. Is that okay. a little clearer? Or? Yes, definitely. Yeah, thank you. So, um, so I can answer that in the context of the experiment that we talk about, or just in general. So let me do a little of both. So the experiment that we talked about, they, what they were doing was, it was so these experiments were early experiments. So in the earliest experiments, you want to do things in a simple way. You don't want to add too many variables. You want to keep things simple. So what they did is they they looked at specific. So again, the con the the ideas and the thoughts that they presented to the people, to the participants, and, and they were lying in these MRI machines. And the MRI machine, there's a video screen above, you know, they're laying down and there's a video screen above there, which on which they can either put an image or a word, they can type a word there that appears for them. Um, and then that's a prompt to tell the person what they need to think about. So in that, they, they had, I think in this study, um, it was around 60 words that they chose very specifically, and they limited it only to those 60 words. 
and the participants had, had run through prior to this MRI portion of the study, they had another part of the study where they went through and did a mock, they did a mock study, which was not looking at the same, they, but they, what, they, what effectively did is they made the people familiar with the 60 words without telling them much about what the experiment really involved. So the people were familiar with the words, they were familiar with imagining about the words, things like that. So they were primed, they were prepared to do the main part of the study. So for that, deception wouldn't really work because you know you don't want to deceive them. You want them to know and be familiar with the 60 words that they were dealing with. But in, you know, in a, in a more general way, the question you're asking about deception is that if deception is happening, can we detect the pattern of a certain thought in a person's mind, even when they're being deceived? That's, I think, the broader question you're asking, which is a very good question. Um, and and it, it actually, Get, get, it gets into two areas. So one is that right now we are not sophisticated enough in this technique. Actually, this technique right now cannot really read anyone's mind. Okay, and I think in the in the in the um, uh, the videos and, and uh, paper that I linked to, I think they clearly state that this is not mind reading. We are nowhere near mind reading. These are very simple studies where we are able to actually identify specific among a certain set. For example, among 60 things, we can identify which of those 60 it is. But if we had if we if we had a person coming into the MRI and they were they were asked to think of anything in the world, it would be impossible for us to identify what out of the any many millions of things that they could think about, what it is it would be impossible. Literally cannot be done. So mind reading is not what this is about. This is about from a limited domain of, of knowledge, can we pick out what their mind is, which of those one of those things they're they're looking at. And the experiment actually had many aspects to it where they gave them an object on one hand and then they gave them a, another object, oh, so sorry, they gave them an object which uh, uh, associated with a part of their body that they could hold that to touch their body. And they gave them another object in which they could reside within, for example, something that would be like a shelter. So basically either um, handheld or shelterized, right? These two types of concepts. And they were able to tell distinctly whether the person was thinking of a handheld or you know a, a body morphic object or a shelterized object between these two domains or categories of information. So these are very, very simple stu initial studies that they were doing. And the more recent studies that they've done have gone further and they've expanded into more domains of knowledge, but still they're not kind of advanced enough where if you give a complex sentence to a person, they can tell you exactly the sentence that person is thinking of. We're not there yet. That will take that in one of the videos that the researcher talked to me, I mean, he joked about, oh, we may be there in even five minutes. Obviously, we're not there because the video was more than five, minutes, five years ago. But it, it will be decades from now before we get there. Although the, um, the machine learning side of things is, is moving things really rapidly. So it might not be two or three decades. It might be one decade, but it, it will be, it will be you know, at least one decade away. Thank you. Um, next question is on... Uh, neural marketing. Do you have any comments yeah. about that? Yeah, so that was a, a interesting but scary um, idea that, that came up in one of the videos. And let me just add, uh, so on that, I was going to put another paper in the in the associated reading, but I decided not to because um, it was not on the direct idea, but although it does, it does, you know, the example, the question that you posed explains how this is, this is tied to it. So neuro, let me first say new, what neural marketing is, it's, it's a new field, not new anymore. I mean, it's been about 10 years old. It's where researchers in the neurosciences, what they're doing is they're working with companies, with commercial companies, commercial entities, and they're trying to help them understand how people, consumers, how we deal with, how we think about, how we decide on, what influences us, um, how impressionable we are, how advertising impacts us, all of the aspects around marketing. And they help and to understand and to explain and to exploit, in a sense, um, all of these aspects of marketing to help these consumer-oriented consumer companies. Um, and so neural marketing is, so for example, one of the things um, I think I remember doing in one of the talks I did a lot more than a year ago, there was another video I posted where there was a neural marketing firm which they, they basically studied the effect of perfume. And what you'll find is that in high-end luxury boutiques of any type, for any type of product, luxury watches, luxury clothing, luxury handbags, luxury automobiles, almost every one of these luxury emporiums, luxury shops, they use perfume in a very subtle low level 
they perfuse it into the air, into the HVAC, into the ventilation system. And it's there, but it's below a level where you can perceive it consciously. But it's there, and the type of perfumes that are chosen are have been chosen based on studies that do impact people, especially the types of consumers, the market that, that they're trying to target. So they do work. Um, so it, I don't, and, and many researchers don't like this area of the, of the, you know, the field. It is there. Um, but also I do want to mention that this area is also not very strong in its science because it's not very easy to figure out. And also, again, we're making, we're making broad, you know, these researchers are making very broad generalizations. So for example, what impacts a luxury buyer of a car versus a non-luxury buyer of a car? The assumption is that it's the same thing, but in reality is it's not the same thing, right? But in these types of neuromarking studies, a lot of times they do these gross types of, um, you know, similarities which oftentimes are, are shown in the real world to not exist. So it's very difficult, very expensive, and oftentimes they don't work, work out as well as, as uh, that's the reason why that field, some field has not grown very much. Um, the, the paper that I wanted to link was, uh, was done by, and it was not done intentionally for neuromarking purposes, it was done as part of this activity, as part of understanding whether um, our encoding of, of tangible objects in the world can be discerned or not. And what the research of this is actually very, um, prominent, a very famous researcher uh, name of uh, John Dylan Haynes. Um, and what he did is his team, they did a study where they took a group of two, a group of people and uh, actually two groups, you know, they, they split the, the, um, the subjects into two uh, subsets, into two um, um, uh, cohorts. And one co cohort had, uh, um, was, was, was given uh, a video to watch where um, they were told to focus on something very important that was going to be happening in the video. So basically, there were all these background things happening, but they weren't supposed to, they, they basically weren't paying attention to the background they were because they were told to focus specifically on something else unrelated to the study. So their mind was basically activated and, and kept busy in a way. And the other cohort, they were told to basically focus on something very specific. And the specific thing they were told to focus on was that, and both, both of the videos were about scenes of cars driving on a street. And the, the one cohort, they were told to look at the cars that were passing on the street and try to think of, of the cars that are passing and whether those cars interested them or not, if they like those cars or not, whether they might like to buy those cars or not. Okay. And in the other cohort, um, they were not, they were, they were, kept, their mind was kept busy so that the people basically, most of the people after they were questioned, they didn't even realize there were cars off, or they, they didn't even pay attention to the cars. The fact was they were told to look at people in the, in the, in the video that were doing things and they were focused on that. So their brain really, their conscious brain was not focused on the, um, uh, the cars at all. But what they found was that ir irrespective of whether the people were focused on the cars or not, both people in both categories, their brain actually did sort out the cars based on whether they met their personal preferences of the cars they liked or not. Okay. Even though the people were not actively looking at the cars, subconsciously their mind was looking at them. Okay. That was an aspect of this that, that came out, which was important because what that basically says is that even when we're not looking at something as a consumer, we are. We're living in the world, going through the world as a consumer. Although we're not thinking of, of the act of buying, we're always judging and we're always looking at things. Is it interesting to us? Is it something that matches our taste or not? That's the way we perceive many things in the world. And that's what one of the things that study found. There was another study that this researcher did also, which goes into consciousness and, and free will, which I won't go into, but, but you, know, the, you know, there are a lot of areas of, of studies when people do that actually the research is, is for looking at a specific area, but out of the findings and out of the, the data that comes out, there are other information that can come out that actually they can extrapolate from also. And so it's very interesting. And what, one of the things that there was another study that they did in this area, and actually one of the videos, oh, so let me, actually let me explain. So one of the videos where there was a researcher who was looking at, um, they, they had people study, uh, um, participants decide whether they're going to add or subtract. Okay. So basically the, the, the study participants were, were told to decide in their mind ahead of time. Okay. I'm going to either add, they, they were given two numbers. Okay. They were given on, on the MRI screen, they were given two numbers. And the only prompt were these two numbers. And they were told they could decide on their own okay, whether they wanted to add the numbers together or subtract the numbers together. And they had two buttons in their hands, one button that was plus and one button that was minus. And when they decided they were supposed to press one of the two buttons, okay, and they did that. 
and they went through this and they went through this and they went all through all the participants. Okay? Now what they found was that all of the participants, um, well, basically what they found was that there was a region in the brain and it was in the prefrontal cortex. It was in lower uh, medial, so toward the middle, middle of, of both of the hemispheres, toward the center. So a very core primitive area of our brain, um, which was involved in decision making, simple decision making around addition, addition subtraction, okay, simple mathematics. And that region, basically it was like a, like a, um, a pie chart, overlapping pie chart. Um, and so what they found was that they could very conclusively, the, the MRI st scans of all of those participants very conclusively could, could show, independent of what the actual button was, just by looking at the MRI images, they could figure out which people chose plus and which show people chose minus. Okay. Very high percentage rate. So what that, that also showed is that the, the brain itself had a region for adding, for in planning to add, intention to add, so intentionality. And another region for, you know, but they were correlated, they were very close to each other, another region for planning to subtract. Now, out of that study, what they also found out was that the MRI signals actually occurred as, as close as four seconds before they actually pushed the button. And, and, and from, from their recollection, as far as before they even were aware, consciously aware that they were going to make the decision. So this is another version of the Libet and the other experiments that we've talked about earlier in other, other meetups, where consciousness and free will. Now this, this, this experiment wasn't looking at free will, but it, it, you know, the data, because the decision of the people arose in the MRI earlier than they even were aware consciously of, of their having made that decision of what to do, add or subtract. The data in the MRI was there, meaning their mind, certain parts of their mind, which were in their subconscious, had already thought and decided. And then after a few seconds, that decision floated into their consciousness and then they became aware of it. So that's that's another aspect of that that we see here. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. So Sanjay, um, we are doing a whole bunch of meetups on language from multiple angles. So I want to try to connect, you know, in, in the honor of comprehensivist Wednesday. Yeah. I want to connect up what you're doing with that. So my first question, I'll have like two or three questions connecting up to various things we are looking at in language. First question was the question from uh, about Steven Pinker. How is it that this one network communicates with another network right. through a line? Right, so, so this, this, this idea is very complicated because there's, there's basically everything about humanness that's tied into it, okay? What it means for us to understand what we're saying Believe it or not, we don't always understand what we're saying. And what we say, a sentence that we say, oftentimes has more than one meaning, right? And the speaker may have one meaning or they may have multiple meanings in mind. And they may not realize there's a third or fourth or fifth meaning, right? And the same thing applies to, to the listener, right? The listener may, may have one interpretation they take of the sentence, right? That thread, that line, that connecting line. But there may be multiple meanings. Or the listener may take a completely different meaning that, than what the speaker meant. Right. So that's one aspect of intention. And, and so, so the transmission and the reception can be. Uh, so there's many aspects to that. Another aspect is the uh, familiarity with um, the ideas that are being presented. OK, so when the speaker says something right, and if the speaker is, is uh, highly cognizant, highly aware of the topic they're talking about. Right. And so they distill this very complicated idea into the sentence. Right. The goal is. Their goal is to make sure that that one simplified sentence enters this network of the other person and filters through and takes shape and form similar to how it is in the speaker's mind. Mm -hmm. The reality is that that rarely happens, but it does happen roughly most of the time, depending on the similarity of the people, the similarity of their experiences, similarity of their intellectual or emotional levels, educational levels, things like that. Um, similarity of the culture that they society that they live in um, these aspects so there's many many aspects to human human humankind that come into play in communication communication is very very complicated it's one of the most complicated things we do um, it's it's intentional um, so another aspect is that if you get into um, nonverbal aspects of communication so when the speaker is communicating their their hand i'm using the hands right so their hands may be active their facial expressions definitely are right to some extent, even pheromones might come out, 
We don't know. We don't believe it. Maybe it's possible. Um, so um, there are many, many types of information that their neural network, their brain network, is sending out through the muscles. Their cheeks moving, right? Lips obviously moving, tongue, you know, the sounds. Obviously, all of that is controlled. But there are many things, the rate of blinking of their eyes, whether the eye is directly looking at the other person, looking at their face, looking at their nose, looking at or far away, you know, those things are subtle, but they convey a lot of information. I am paying attention. I'm not paying attention. You're important. You're not important. These are concepts. These are emotional concepts that can be made separate from that line. So actually, when we talk about a single line being conveyed, there are actually multiple invisible threads that are running parallel with and sometimes delayed, right, delayed in time. And sometimes there may be the predecessor lines that were spoken ahead of time that modify the interception of the succeeding lines that get spoken. So this is all very complicated aspects of communication that we deal with. Wonderful. And it works. It usually it usually works. We kind of understand each other. Yes. Uh, wonderful. Uh, let me take uh, another uh, person we are studying. His name is uh, Owen Barfield. He's a colleague of C.S. Lewis uh, uh, and a good friend of C.S. Lewis and Tolkien. And are you familiar with his work by any chance? Um, I've heard of him, but uh, not. No, let, uh, I mean, I would summarize his thought as what he's saying is that. Did he we, write uh, the Narnia series? Uh, no, C.S. Lewis did. Okay. But uh, C.S. Lewis, you know, uh, Barfield was the executor of the will of C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis' first book is dedicated to Barfield. Barfield's first book is dedicated to C.S. Lewis. So there's a very close relationship between these three, three people, uh, in the third being uh, Tolkien. Um, now, Barfield is the linguist. He is the philologist. So all the deepest ideas about language come from him. And his formulation is that language has the power to produce a felt change of consciousness. He holds that what he, he focuses on the power of metaphors. So you're passing a metaphor of something that you can see in physical world and in a way, in a dramatic way, so that it actually lights up the network in the other brain. And that is the power that language at its best have. So when is it like you, we experience this when we read poetry, for example, great poetry that we love, where just you will hear a sentence and it will just, you will have this aesthetic experience, um, cognitive experience of saying, wow, I see the world slightly differently now. Um, so in, any thoughts about this kind of high end power of language and poetry that can produce those effects? Yeah, yeah, I, I love this question. Um, excellent. I mean, these are things that I, as I was when I was younger, when I was in high school, I used to talk, you know, I went into philosophy because of these types of questions. So wonderful. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so there's so many things that tie into this question, this idea. Um, so the conversation, the, the line, the poet, the poetry, the, the, the line of the poem that, that uh, gets sent. Um, it, it requires a familiarity between the, the, uh, the, the creator and the listener, right? Um, there has to be vocabulary, shared vocabulary. There has to be common dictionary, right? So not only vocabulary, but the meaning of some meaning, words have many meanings, right? Um, there are homophones. So if they say, if the poem, because the poem is spoken, Right. So it's not we don't know if, if when they say the word red, is it R-E-D or R-E-A-D? Right. It's not clear. So you have to interpret. So um, the aspect of language comes into play. The aspect of connotations come into play. The aspect, aspect of context, the context of, of words within the sentence and the sentence within other sentences. And all of those sentences within the, the present moment that they are staying in in the moment. Right. And the context of the world that they live in. Right? Is it the 20th century, the 21st century, or the 17th century? Right? These contexts. Um, there are social dynamics. So right now, are we living in in the um, in the middle of of a, of, a, of a war, right? Where there's social upheaval, or is it a, a you know is there physical stress? So are we living in a world where there's environmental upheaval and and climate change happening? Right? Um, 
you know, aesthetic, you use the word, I love that word. Um, the aesthetic, the aesthetics of um, the, uh, the poetry, of, of, of the, the mellifluousness of the words, how they tie together, how they evoke concepts that are other, other concepts separate from the word, you know. Um, these are all aspects to, to that line that exchanges. Um, there may be aspects to the personal that the speaker or the author who wrote the poem, right? There are things in their lives that are happening that the, that the listener may not be aware of, but that may come out through the poetry, right? Um, what was her name? I forget her name, but a young poet, uh, she's the, um, uh, um, what is, uh, um, um, on Oba uh, sorry, uh, Biden's inauguration. Amanda Gorman. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, wonderful. We, we, I mean, the, the, her, the poem that she read, well, we could see the, the personal um, experience that she, and she's a young person, you know, the personal experience she, she went through and what it meant for her, you know, freedom and, and, and America and liberty, all these concepts. Um, so, you know, there's so many aspects to emotions and personal uh, ideas uh, that, that come out through poetry and, and through language, um, and they all come to play. Um, let, me, let me try to think of some other, uh, the, these I would say would be the, I don't want to say trite, but these are the common trends that everybody everybody's aware of, I, I, I suspect. Um, so when we when we deal with poetry, there are complete, so poetry also can be negative, right? Negative in the sense that negative space. So you give a bunch of words, but the idea being expressed is that word which is lacking among those words, right? That's an example. So, um, and, and that depends on whether the other person um, is sophisticated enough to understand that type of poetry, right? That the speaker is saying that they're giving them a message of negative, negative space of missingness. Um, there may be ideas around. Um, let's see. So, so some poems, what they do is they they create scenes, right? They create an ambiance, right? An aesthetic. Um, other poems, they what they do is they shock, right? They bring you out of the moment, they bring you out of the present moment that we share, you know, that we're in. And they use vivid, strong words, or, or you know, in some way, to take you out of it and put you into a completely different place that the author wants you to be in. And then they play and play, and it's a game. And it's it's intentional, but it's but it's and it's, it's mutual. It's you know, the, the, the listener wants to because they're, they're willingly. Um, but it's a way to take you to another place. Um, where you haven't been, or you you know you, you either you've never been, or you haven't been for a long time. But it's a way to change your mindset completely, to to take you out of your present mindset, anything and everything about your mindset, and take you into. So, for example, they might take you inside of a black hole, right, where none of us have been, but through poetry they can do that. Um, so you know, in many many aspects to it that that uh, that come to mind. All right. So two more questions. Um, the first one of these is we've been studying Tao Te Ching, Gospel of John, and Bhagavad Gita in parallel. Tao Te Ching, you know, Jason is doing translations from Mandarin for us. So we have some contact with Mandarin there. For Bhagavad Gita, Yogeshwar is doing translation from Sanskrit. So you have some contact with Sanskrit. Gospel of John, though it is English, it is English written at a different time. And that also works very differently than the modern English. So it's very interesting to notice how these different languages, the English, which is alphabetical language, and you've got this Mandarin, which is very different, and Sanskrit, which is very different. So any thoughts about how these three different languages of three you know, great cultures, you know, the West, uh, China, and India, whether there is any difference in, you know, what, 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 what is the difference in the way in which they operate uh, in our brain? So um, we're going to go into some speculation because this is not, um, so with language across the board, all languages, all human languages, um, there still are similarities between all of them, right? Because as, as I said earlier, we all share some very, very fundamental basic experiences when we grow up. We all have a mother, uh, you know, we have to be born of a mother. Uh, usually there's a father or father figure around. Um, there is a small community or a large community. There's some type of community. 
we live on a physical planet, not in the ocean. It might be near ocean, but we're not, most of us are not living in the ocean, right? So um, there are many aspects to the world that, that give us commonality. Um, and then the, the human side of the world is actually um, vast and, and complicated, but that gives a lot more that we don't realize the commonality between us. For example, the fact that all of us, um, so, so just even the, the physical aspects of humanness, that we all can move, we all talk and, and hear, listen, right? We can taste and, and etc. We have emotions, we can feel and hug and, and, and etc. So um, these are all physical aspects of our, of our bodiness, of our humanness. Um, we, then the social aspects, we all have tussles, we have fights, we have um, uh, affect, affections, affectations, we have um, uh, hostility, we have uh, envy, we have um, competition, you know, the, these emotions and these behaviors exist in pretty much every uh, group of people. Um, then we have um, hierarchies, right? Every, every group of people have hierarchies. We have leaders, we have followers, we have people who want to become leaders, we have people who are uh, uh, become leaders and they're toppled, right? So there, there's these dynamics around, around relationships. Um, so all of these aspects are parts of the languages that we have. And then there are aspects of the, the so the language also is, so I'm assuming you're talking about written, but I'm going to, sorry, spoken, but I'm going to bring in written also because these um, ancient uh, texts were all written and that's how they're, they're maintained. That's how we still have them. Although there's a strong oral tradition in the Asian ones that was very important. That's, you know, there's a time period that they passed through that. So the oral and the written are both important aspects of language that, especially this question, because the texts that went through the oral period, not written, there are certain aspects of our oral behaviors that imprinted on the way that those stories exist. And the parts that never went through that phase, those also imprint. So for example, the, the Gospel of John, from my understanding, I mean, it did have an oral phase also, because even the Bible had oral phases, but it was much less than uh, the Aoji Ping and, and, the, and the Gita. Um, but so the time period and also the um, the so the number of years, the number of centuries, as well as the um, number of people involved who were responsible, who had to be responsible to keep the stories intact and unchanged um, and their memories. Um, another thing that's important here is that in the past, from what we know in the past, memory and recollective memory was very, very good, very much better than we have today. People could remember long, long passages learn it at a young age and remember it into their upper years, into their senior years. And they can remember, you know, I, I had an uncle who um, memorized many, many poems as a child, as a, as a student, a college student. And in his 70s and 80s, he could recite them, you know, uh, 20 minutes of a poem, you know. Um, so <laughs> that fascinated me, but, but um, so, so all of these aspects of language come to play when we're talking about these three. Um, also, th then, then the, cultural aspects. So for example, the, the Gospel of John, specifically the uh, geographic area is, we, today we might characterize it as desert-like, although in the past, in, in at the time period, it's believed it was not as much a desert. It, there was much more greenery and, and flowing water rivers and things like that there. Um, but the um, nomadic nature was there even then. Um, it was sort of desert-like, um, the types of animals. And the types of and that affected the types of relationships because in a nomadic setting, the type of relationships and the length of time you can have relationships with people and how strong the bonds would be and the types of words you have to use to communicate. How do you engage uh, somebody else you're telling a story with, right? You, the types of words you have to use to engage them and keep them because if they're busy in, in, a, in a desert where it's more important to find your meal because it's more difficult to find your meal. So you're not going to be as actively listening to the speaker Right, so yeah, so speaker has to use different types of words, different types of emotions, to 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 raise the flock, so to speak. So these are all aspects that come to play. Um, I think those are probably um, things that explain why the languages are different, why um, some things are more ornate and flowery, and others are less ornate and flowery. Why some things are more philosophical and more uh, existential, you might say, or more uh, difficult to understand, or multi-layered. You know, some, in some of these texts, the ideas are multi-layered, whereas in others, they're very straight and down to earth and, and a direct message that they're trying to impart. 
Um, I think the reasons, those are the reasons, uh, you know, some of the reasons why. Wonderful. I, I just love that you brought in the entire context in which the language develops as a way of understanding it. Beautiful. Uh, may I ask you one last question? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Okay. Um, we are studying style, style of writing, style of speaking. Uh, there is this book called Clear and Simple as the Truth, a very, very interesting book. And it identifies multiple styles. It identifies the practical style where, you, it is, where the person who knows how to do something is just explaining to somebody how to do it with little else. Then there is the plain style where, which holds that anybody can understand anything. Even a child can understand everything, uh, anything. And there is the subjective style or introspective style, which just is talking about almost a stream of consciousness, about what is going on in someone's consciousness. There is a romantic style, which says that you get these insights at some point and you're trying to express it. And there is the classic style, which is in the 17th century French style, Mark Twain, people like that. So it's really fascinating to see how these different styles of writing and speaking work um, within individuals. So any thoughts about these different styles of writing or speaking and how they operate on the brain? Um, so, yeah, <laughs> I, I like this, this question because um, it gets to what's the best way, well, well, two things it gets to. One, one is that not every style works with everyone, right? And second, is it possible even, or what is the best way to determine the best style for the situation we're in, right? And, and one of the most challenging aspects is when you're speaking to audiences, large groups of people, especially, because there's not one style, you can't rely on one style. You have to, you have to kind of, um, you know, come with a, 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 a salad or a soup or a, a, you know, a melting pot of styles. Um, so let, let me, so, I'm trying to think of, so you want me to just talk about the various types of styles or, or what? Or, Any observations, or I can I can tell you the description of the classic style. No, no, I, I understand. I, I'm familiar with many of those styles. So, okay. so, so just, so you just, you want me to kind of type my thoughts around them? Sure, that, please. Okay, okay. So I, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I so, um, I mean, for, so personally, I, I believe in, in uh, I don't remember the, the term that you used for it, but I believe that, anybody in a theoretical sense anybody can understand anything there is a limit because if you if the brain that a person is born with has severe deficiency then there are limits but for most normal people anybody can understand almost anything but it requires time it requires patience and an explanation and depth right it's, it requires time to understand but if you have time and if you have a, a patient teacher then I think anybody can understand anything. And that, that fundamentally is what I've experienced and what I've seen in the world is that anything, no matter how complicated, the most complicated things in the world can be explained to anyone. And I start from that point of view. So taking that point of view, the other ones to me are elaborations on that, on that theory. This is a theory, my theory, um, but I think other people share it also. So I think the other aspects are elaborations of that. So for example, um, and, and they're, they're, you can you can add flavors to this basic technique or tenet of of, of um, you know in the conversation the first line that you give out you look for visual clues um, as to did the person get that first line or to what extent right and using that you modify your style a little bit and you present the same idea maybe in a different way or it might be a different idea right and then you look to see and if the person asks a question if they look perplexed then you missed it and you want to start over, but you want to do it in a different way. Or you might basically bring in a joke. You know, you might be self-effacing it. <laughs> I'm not doing a good job, am I, right? This is not making sense to you. Let me try again. Uh, then you try again. Um, so um, I think this is the power of communication, because of, of good communicators, because if you can do that, and, and it's easier on one-on-one -on -one or, or small groups, um, if you can do that, then um, there's a greater chance that the other person will understand what you're trying to say. But also, the, the, for me, the most challenging part is that this takes time, especially if the connection is not strong or the connection is not, uh, um, well, the fluid is not uh, romantic, is not very um, easy, is not very um, 
uh, you know, natural. Um, if, if the people aren't familiar with ideas, the two people, you know, one is or isn't, either one, the speaker or the listener, um, then it can be difficult to get, or what can happen is a speaker is, is, is a, uh, not experienced and the, and the listener is very experienced, but the listener asks a question, which goes beyond what the speaker is. So the listener has to ask that question in a way that the speaker can understand. So it's not just one way, right? There's always a conversation going on and the conversation isn't always verbal. Um, but in, even when it's verbal, it, it, it can be, it can be uh, for short periods of time, it can be more in the opposite direction where the listener is asking questions. So, um, you know, the, I, I think style has to be, has to be modified and you have to have more than one style in your repertoire to, to be effective. Yeah, I mean, uh, I want to look at all your answers. And I think one of the key concepts here is that of context. You know, you're trying to understand the context of the other person. And you have to realize what your context is and what that other person's context is. See what commonality exists that you can leverage and see what the differences are, which you have to build up on. And if yeah. you correctly identify your own context and their own context, then your communication is better because you know what to build on, you know, what, what base you have, common base, and what you need to do in order, in order to build on it. I, I would say the, the phrase build up on, I would elaborate on that to say, improve and, and make it better. So the conversation isn't over. So the conversation, because the point is that usually we're, you know, rarely are we communicating a single idea, right? It's a idea and it's a get back and forth and it's a complex set of things that we're discussing. So as you, as the first initial idea, you know, meets resistance or isn't, isn't you know, bounces around, doesn't quite reach, and as, as you get better, then as that idea connects, then the next idea becomes easier because you've already started to narrow down kind of. Although, you know, even that isn't always that, that well done because sometimes you might think that the other person got it, but they actually got it. They actually understood a different variant of what you're trying to say. So you're misunderstanding. They're not understanding by mis mis understanding the cues, the, the cues, right? Um, but then, so you have to be, but so yeah, so the context is critical to this, but I would add another word, which is flexibility. Mm -hmm. So you have to be flexible with the notion that your idea did make it or didn't make it. You have to be flexible with the idea that the signals you're getting back are accurate or inaccurate, that you're misinterpreting them or interpreting them correctly. All of this vast dialogue, this, 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 um, uh, you know, there, there's multiple people, when two people are talking, there are multiple conversations going on, right? And you have to be open to the idea that those multiple conversations, visual and, and, and oral and, and um, multiple levels of cognition, you know, of, of, of theoretical, um, all of these convers some place conversations, um, you have to be flexible in reassessing and reinterpreting what you took to mean and what you're trying to say. Yeah, wonderful. I mean, I would add one, one thing which is implicit in everything you're saying, that communication is a conversation. So it's always two ways. There is no yeah. one way, you know, yeah. because you, you need the feedback, continuous feedback, correction, you know. All right, uh, Sanjay, this is delightful as always. And Joe, thank you for doing the hosting. Really appreciate it. And, no problem. Uh, thank you, everybody. Really. This is fantastic. Uh, next Wednesday, we are going to be looking at Owen Barfield in detail. Uh, if you missed the first meetup, please uh, read, you know, please uh, watch that video. Phil is going to be here talking about Owen Barfield. And um, we're going to start this Sunday. We've got two special meetups. We are starting with Faust. It's going to be introduction to Faust. So you don't have to read everything beforehand. We're going to just get started. Why look at Faust at 5 p.m. Eastern time? And then at 9 p.m. Eastern time, I'm going to give an introduction to this book uh, called Clear and Simple as the Truth. And if you really like that style, classic style, and want to, want to master it, we're going to be doing a series of workshops. Uh, they're going to be very serious workshops. This is something that we have never done before kind of systematically trying to grok or make part of you a style, which is very hard to do actually. And right. it requires a lot of work. So uh, this Sunday is your sampler to say, is this something worth looking at, worth doing? Um, so hope you guys can make it. See you folks.
Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, Shrikant. Thanks, Sanjay. Good night. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Shrikant. Thanks, everyone.